Merhabalar, günaydınlar herkese. Well, yesterday, we focused on what we learned during the pandemic regarding care and uh, the type of future thoughts we had as a result of the pandemic. So these were all presentations that led us to think about the future of care. We focused uh, on how insufficient it was to define care from one single perspective. And of course, we heard a couple of promising examples during the pandemic. Uh, some speakers made us think about possible examples, possible similar examples and practices for the future. And today we will continue with uh, us with similar presentations. We will focus mostly on um, concrete examples. And our starting point was whether a different future was possible, uh, another way of living together, another societal union. Is this possible and how can we organize this? These were some of our ideas while um, preparing this conference, while organizing this conference. This is what we want to discuss. And today uh, we will uh, listen to some examples uh, in which this was kind of tried. This uh, session is called Care and Solidarity or Lack Thereof. Uh, because solidarity is necessary, but we know that it's not enough everywhere. I mean, uh, there was lack of solidarity in many cases as well. And that is why uh, we want to also discuss these in this conference, in this session. We will have uh, three speakers in this session. I don't want to take too much of your time uh, and give them the floor. Uh, they're not here. They're all connecting uh, to us uh, remotely. Our first speaker is journalist Pınar Önç. A couple of words on Pınar Önç. She is a graduate of International Relations Department of Istanbul University. And she's been working as a journalist since 1997. She worked as a reporter and columnist in many journals and I mean, magazines and newspapers and on internet papers. If I'm not wrong, she also uh, writes uh, scripts. She has, she published many books, one on the pandemic. And I know that she wrote a lot of articles on the pandemic. Welcome, Pnar. I hope you can hear me. Hello, I can hear you. Okay, then I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I find this effort uh, very important. Let me first of all start by saying that as time passes, it's becoming clearer that test that the pandemic put us through uh, was a very uh, substantial healthcare, public healthcare crisis. But at the same time, uh, this process touched, I mean, this experience touched many different segments of the society. It changed and transformed many different segments of society. This is just like a chemical substance that was poured onto a page in your notebook, the pandemic. Because once the chemical touched the page, 
some of these things that were already there on the page became darker. Some grew. Some started to overlap. COVID-19 as a virus, of course, left some uh, temporary and permanent marks uh, on the bodies that it contracted. But uh, when life was being shaped, COVID-19 acted as if it were a um, chemical. Whatever inequality there was, uh, be it racism-based, gender-based, uh, class-based, uh, they all became deepened and aggravated. So the critical question here is, did this process make the inequalities more visible? In other words, the chemical expanded the stains, but did they become more visible? Could we benefit from this process? There is, there's a moment that we experienced in the very first weeks of the pandemic because everything was very fresh, people had a very high level of concern, and the new normal was way too new. And that is why the reactions were much more direct and genuine. Uh, many different people around the world stopped for a minute and asked what is going on. They focused on equality, the real content of uh, the effort, the real effort in place, and people question. No, I have to stop you for a minute, I'm sorry. There seems to be a problem on our YouTube broadcast, on our YouTube streaming, and we want your presentation to be available on YouTube. That is why I will have to ask you to stop for a minute. Let's r solve this technical problem, it happens. Yes, now we are fully connected to YouTube. Shall we start from scratch? How would you like to proceed? I mean, you can, you can, uh, you can continue from where you left off because we were already recording everything on Zoom. No, please guide. Please guide me. I can do both. I mean, I can start from scratch. Okay, let's start from scratch na then. Let's start from scratch then. Are we streaming now on YouTube? Let me get a confirmation. We're live. We're live. Okay. Sorry for this. Sorry for this. So we'll start over again. This time, the floor is really yours. Okay. Let me go back. So, as time passed, it became clear to each and every one of us that uh, the pandemic uh, was a test for humanity in this century, and we're still going through this test, to be honest. It was a very substantial public health care crisis, but at the same time, uh, the pandemic touched all areas of life and it touched many different walks of life, it changed and transformed many different walks of life in the society. Uh, for me, it's like a chemical uh, that you pour onto uh, a uh, page in a notebook. There were some stains on that page anyways, and some of those stains became darker, larger, and some of them started to overlap after the chemical, that is after COVID-19. Well, COVID-19 left temporary or uh, permanent marks on the bodies uh, that were contra contracted with it. And on the society, it had the impact that a chemical would have had. Whatever inequality there was in the society, be it uh, gender-based, racism-based, or class-based, uh, they became more profound. All types of inequalities became more profound and aggravated. So the critical question is as follows. Did this process lead to these inequalities becoming more visible? Did we really benefit from this process? Did the chemical make them more visible? Well, 
when the pandemic was fresh, when people had a higher level of concern, the bigger picture was clearer. There was a moment there uh, when the bigger picture was clearer because it was very clear who could stay at home and who couldn't. In other words, it was very clear who was left with no defense against the deadly virus. And it was very clear to our naked eye, it was very direct to our naked eye, uh, how our lives at home had changed as well. So we had that moment in different geographies of the world. Uh, large masses around the world ask themselves, what are we going through? What is happening to us? And they all ask questions uh, about the real work that makes the world go around. But this was a very brief moment because everything was changing very fast. So the chemical kept pouring onto the notebook and there was a total confusion and chaos. So we lost the bigger picture there, or actually we, we got lost in the bigger picture is a better way of saying it. For example, um, domestic care work it, and its invisibility, women's poverty, gender-based reasons that stand in the way of women's employment. Well, I can say tons of things on any of these uh, matters and the pandemic had a significant impact on all of these uh, matters but I will try to give you examples uh, from concrete stories from concrete real life stories I can do this because I wrote a book on this called uh, the pandemic casualties I started working on this book the very first day uh, that the first official uh, death was announced due to COVID-19. So I got in touch with 35 people, men and women, uh, from different backgrounds, uh, different jobs, uh, different geographies. So I reached out to 35 people and I uh, discussed with them the impact of uh, the pandemic on care. This started in March 2020. Uh, I wrote several articles up until the end of May on this very same issue. Uh, a year later, uh, of official death figure reached 50,000, but the real figure is believed to be three times that. I called the same people again a year later those 35 people and I asked them what changed in their lives in the course of that one year and that is I ha that is how I ended up with the book the casualties of the pandemic and I will share with you some stories from that book the first example is an example where care work is very central uh, it's the story of a white color woman in her early 40s her name is Esra, uh, she was a software developer and her main concern was not her employer or her working or her changing working conditions. She didn't relate working from home to her job necessarily, but she was about to go crazy because she was working very hard and she needed a lot of focus and concentration. She had to continue with her job, but she had to take care of her six-year-old daughter, uh, her remote education, her distant education, and all the uh, housework. So she was being crashed under this pile, she told me. Now, this is an experience that many women actually experienced. Her, her, her house was like a, a lab. I mean, uh, her husband uh, works in the tourism industry and he also was physically at home. I mean, there was no tourism uh, during that phase, so he didn't have to focus that much on work during that time. All of the variables had changed. 
and this was like a lab test which showed her that all the care work was automatically assigned to the woman. Either Essa was to deal with each and every effort or she was to manage all of these efforts. She was in charge of distributing the uh, workload as well. Co she had to tell her husband, cook this, take care of that. And that too is very tiring. The management effort is also very tiring. And she was sick and tired of it. And she was experiencing this worthlessness in the times of the pandemic because she was feeling she wasn't feeling enough. And she was comparing herself to her mother. Her mother was a teacher and she went back to her childhood, remembered how her mom came back from work cooked for them, cleaned for them, left early in the morning and went back to school. And she complained, she compared herself to her mother and said she wasn't enough. Her mom was enough, but she wasn't. She even downloaded an app on her phone to remind her to drink water. But that too irritated her, so she ended up deleting the app. A year later, she was changed, she was transformed to a certain extent. Uh, when she was referring to her husband at first, she was more indirect and more ironic. But a year later, the sentences were much more direct. She accepted the fact that she couldn't resolve this distribution of labor at home and she was sad about it, she was sorry about it. Uh, it was such a year for her that she was living in Istanbul, she was working from home, all of her relations changed and she started questioning again what she wanted from life and it was very clear for her that a part of the questioning was her marriage. And of course, there is also the caregiver part of the story. Essa was kind of lucky. I mean, she had this very strict crisis because all of a sudden she was left without without the help uh, that she was benefiting from thanks to her financial means. But after minor normalization, she was able to hire her the, hire the help back because there was this uh, woman that they were who she was working with for a very long time and she could afford hiring her back. That is why, um, I mean, Essa paid Nevin even when Nevin couldn't work during the pandemic. You know, many women who work in care services uh, and most of them are immigrants are were left with no means at all when the pa pandemic uh, striked at first. They were left without any income. So things uh, became a bit more normal after a while. And they organized this new order because Nevin uh, was uh, ha had heart disease, so, but they agreed on a new uh, order she didn't use public transport that much, etc., and she could come back home. Let me tell you a bit about Nevin, the caregiver, the, the help that Essa hired. Um, she's of a certain age and she had to work. Um, her husband, in spite of the fact that people were at home mostly, uh, her husband didn't stay at home. He's a gambling addict. And that is why he contracted COVID-19 at the very early stage. This created a crisis because Nevin has heart disease. 
and she also takes care of a six-year-old child and she discovers that her husband has gambling debt, debt. and right in the middle of the pandemic she decides to get a divorce from her 30 year husband 30 year old husband from uh, from her husband to 30 years i uh, heard this story i heard similar stories from other people i heard it from another woman uh, who was subjected to violence for 19 years in her marriage she had considered leaving her husband before the pandemic as well but she could never put it to life but this time during the pandemic she found in, in, in herself the courage to make this radical radical decision and leave her husband so we had all these examples as well i will now tell you about a positive example that changed uh, through the pandemic Semra, another woman, 35-year-old, uh, works in the textile business. She used to live in uh, a small Anatolian town. Before she moved to Istanbul, um, she was oppressed by her father and older brother. And this is a very rare example, but when she got married, she became freer. She loves her husband. Her life changed through marriage. She works very hard in the textile sector. She's been working um, for many years now, uh, from an early age onwards. Of course, because of the pandemic, um, her working conditions got heavier. She developed this fear of uh, being laid off. But there was something significantly different in her uh, example because they had a more equitable order in their household uh, they had an equal share of work and the children grew with the same idea with the same understanding as well so her life was quite different her adolescent daughter cooked for example uh, semra fixed the table then her husband um, did the dishes, etc. So this made her life easier. And psychologically, it relieved her. And it gave her, it gave them actually, the chance to take care of their children who were psychologically distressed. Because Semra works very hard. She sews, um, she sews um, socks each and every day. She works 10 hours per day. But when she comes back home, she wants to play games with her children or she wants to uh, do Pilates, watching YouTube videos with her daughter. So maybe physically she's tired, but uh, psychologically she was motivated. So she was one of the good examples. Now I'll go back to Esra, the software developer. I'll go back to the plaza where she used to work before the pandemic. Let's say uh, Sevda, another woman, works at that Starbucks. Sevda is 26 and she started working in the fast food uh, sector for, from an early age onwards. She works in the service uh, industry. And when I first talked to her, uh, in the first months of the pandemic, she told us about how the services sector was affected by the pandemic, the first cases, etc. Uh, when I first talked to her, she was uh, engaged. And of course, they had their ups and downs. And many people contracted COVID. Uh, their wedding was postponed, etc. But she got married. So this changed Sevda's life. In the following manner, Sevda has been working uh, for many years now, and this has to do with her personality, with her character. Um, Sevda had some very good observations regarding the patriarchal uh, system. She knows how to make fun of the patriarchal system, and she works at a Starbucks uh, at an office building so she has a very good idea of 
how she ran into the white collar ego. So the next time I saw her, she was a bit more relieved and she had another very good observation. And she said, even uh, the disadvantaged white collars now work, continue to work at office buildings. The others, they work from home. And that is why she no longer faces the white collar ego as much as she used to. But she ended up with another problem. She got married, she built a house, and she tried to make a living. I mean, the pandemic created a, regret, uh, a repression or uh, a slowdown, an economic slowdown through, and stagnation throughout the world. But this was even deeper in Turkey. And this was quite a severe experience for a young couple. And Sevda said the following, her husband works uh, at the cash register at a supermarket chain. And psychologically, the process was very tiring for her husband. And Sevda was in charge of consoling him, that is providing care to him from that perspective. Uh, reminding him of the idea that things will not stay as bad as they are. So Sevda was put in charge of providing him that kind of a care. Well, and then I interviewed a health technician working at a state hospital in Izmir. So this person told me about uh, the experience of nurses, uh, elderly home workers, etc. This person was quite active in a trade union where there were nurses and janitors working at hospitals, etc. or caregivers working at hospitals, etc. And um, he mostly told me about uh, the rights that the caregivers in elderly homes experienced and lost you know um, because they were never they were no more given uh, a night shift race and they were kept away from their houses uh, for maybe 10 or 15 days uh, they couldn't ask for they couldn't go on leave they couldn't ask for a change of location and they couldn't appeal to any of these decisions Two nurses, for example, uh, organized a protest. Uh, actually, they didn't organize a protest, but they said uh, in, in a commemoration for, for, for people who lost their lives, they said, we, we're getting depleted. You're not, you're not able to manage this process. And uh, uh, they became subject to an investigation because of these words that they used. And I asked Özgür about uh, the most memorable moments she experienced during this process. Uh, we know that people in the healthcare sector were very hardly hit by this process. And she told me the story of a cleaning lady working at a hospital. She had a baby. Uh, she wasn't allowed to go home and lactate her baby. And that is why she had a nervous breakdown. I mean, people were talking about how sacrificially uh, healthcare workers were working, but all these women working in the care, um, services, they couldn't benefit from the incentives given by the government. So in all these stories, um, people got either professional support to share uh, the housework, or it wasn't shared at all, or other family, other female family members built some form of solidarity. And one of the concepts 
that was uh, emphasized during the pandemic was solidarity. And I will tell you another story regarding solidarity. I would like to talk about a 42-year-old microbiologist. He was a doctor and uh, he did something that was unprecedented during the first months of the pandemic. That was a time when the health care workers were being applauded and then they were forgotten. And during those times, in the hospitals, gender equality was not a matter of concern. Nobody was discussing the gender inequalities inside the healthcare institutions. And uh, nobody mentioned how men <coughs> were dominant in the healthcare institutions. Nobody wanted to talk about those distinctions. Nobody listened. And everybody thought that it was an unnecessary feministic movement to discuss the uh, distinctions between men and women in healthcare services. But this doctor, when I talked to him about a year later, once after the pandemic broke out, there were not significant changes. <clears throat> when the conditions became even harsher, there were no improvements. The reason why I wanted to talk about this doctor is that he's had significant transformation in their private life. They wanted to divorce their spouse before the pandemic, but because of the quarantine, because of the lockdowns, and because of the very intensive first couple of months, they couldn't find the opportunity to officially divorce, and they were forced to share the same environment for an entire year. But after a year, they've had the opportunity to separate from their spouse and move on to a new house with their child. But inside the hospital, he has seen many immigrants, many asylum seekers come to the hospital in and out. And they have helped them to realize what the situation was all about. They have done everything in their capability to allow the asylum seekers to have access to healthcare services in every aspect possible. And there were many immigrants, there were many asylum seekers living around the hospital with no financial means whatsoever. They couldn't get access to healthcare services at the time, and they were very concerned. So, beyond being a healthcare worker, they have helped the asylum seekers and the immigrants around the hospital to uh, shop for groceries. So, they have forged a very close solidarity. In the next session, we are going to uh, listen to the Deep Poverty Network. And this is something close to my heart, and I would like to uh, quote a definition that was stated by them. I'm an introvert, and at the pandemic, everybody seemed to have converged around the same topic. The physical and the spiritual distance was never a challenging item for me. So I turned to myself. I realized the fact that there were many things to be done. There were many people to be helped outside. And when I was doing that, I found the chance to connect with myself. I was enlightened. The dizziness at the beginning seemed to wipe, out, wipe away. And I was enlightened. I was awakened. I managed to forge closer relations with the people who were challenged. It was with the immigrant families that I went into their homes and I witnessed their living conditions. I was a limited person in the past, and I just wanted to cross over the borders in order to touch the people who were in need. I was no longer sad. It was weird. I couldn't practice my skills, but I believe during this time, I've managed to survive. I feel like I'm a survivor. 
And I thought everything I did would contribute to the betterness of the world. In order to tackle, I had to take care of myself and take care of everybody around me. People were intimidated to go into enclosed spaces. But that was the time when I walked into people's homes in order to gain confidence. Gaining confidence was all about helping people. This was one of the longest stories, and this is one of the most impactful stories that I have experienced, actually. I spent the pandemic with 35 people around me, and it created a feeling of being amongst what was going on. I was right there in the middle of what was going on. In different levels, we suffered from different losses, but we had enjoyed certain gains as well. And I think considering our gains will be crucial in order to define our future lives. I would like to thank you for listening to me. And this is all I wanted to say. We would like to thank you, Pınar Örnç, for your provision of different perspectives from women coming from all walks of life working in different sectors. As you have stated at the beginning, we would like to question if the pandemic made certain challenges more visible for women or not. In the last year's conference, Denis Pandioti said something. She said that women became more invisible during the pandemic, but it is crucial to allow women to become more visible it's very important to allow women to make certain calculations about their lives. I'm working, I'm being pressurized. I'm suffering in the hands of my employers. I'm suffering in the hands of my spouses and my children. So this brings us to a point where all the burden had been loaded on the shoulders of women. We're talking about a solidarity but solidarity is very difficult to achieve, even in the smallest households. Solidarity appears to have been forged outside the households for women. Women found different networks of solidarity outside of their homes. And this is a trend that is going to continue. There are certain things we can change. And care, the concept of care becomes really important because we are trying to institutionalize it. We are going to receive the questions collectively over the YouTube uh, channel and uh, over other channels that are available. We are going to allow the second speaker to deliver their presentation and then we will cultivate your questions. Tuce Nevrus Özçelik is representing Kadıköy uh, Solidarity network and she's going to be together with us this morning let me say a few words about her if you would allow me Nevrus Tuğçe Özçelik has been a member of Halk Evleri since 2010 she's a geophysicist but she's not working in this field for the last 15 years, she has been specifically involved with children and women. She has established Chopul TV, and she has been a volunteer on Sendika TV channel on YouTube. And she has been leading certain workshops on violence against women and domestic violence. During the pandemic, the Kadıköy Solidarity Network had been prominent and they were involved in significant assistance projects with regards to women. And in last year's conference, she was so articulate in telling how assistive they have been with regards to women coming from all walks of life. Well, thank you. Hello. I hope you can uh, hear my voice. I am sorry for being here. I am receiving a training on research and rescue activities. This is a camp that I needed to uh, attend. S search and rescue training obliged me to be here this morning. 
Can you hear me clearly? I just wanted to receive a confirmation from you. If you experience any difficulties, please tell me. I need to be here this morning, as I said. And from where Pinar left off, I would like to proceed with talking about Kadıköy Solidarity Network. With the pandemic, we had declared the establishment of Kadıköy Solidarity Network. We are talking about being able to uh, forge a solidarity and not being able to forge a solidarity. That's why I am willing to be a little self-critical in terms of what we have done. There was a denial strategy since the outbreak and everybody was expected to quarantine, self-quarantine, but the conditions there were not equal. The uh, financial and other burdens were supposed to be assumed by individuals instead of the state. And through Kadikari Solidarity uh, Network, we just wanted to extend a helping hand to the people who were obviously in need. We had a closed group within Facebook. We focused on the people that we were familiar with. It was very important for this network to be secure because we were sharing our financial means, we were sharing everything that we possessed, we were writing our addresses openly, and we were asking for support in every fashion possible. But then the inequalities started to rise strikingly. People who had the opportunity could easily quarantine, self-quarantine in their households. They could shop online, they could purchase everything, they could afford everything. But then there were people who were extremely castrated in terms of what they could afford and what they could have access to. And that was the time when we realized that the political power holders we're not giving people the means to guarantee their living during the lockdown. That's why we wanted to establish the Kadikar Solidarity uh, Network, including 20 different districts in Istanbul. At the onset, we saw that the youngsters could leave their homes to a limited extent and that we could use them to provide assistance to the elderly, such as buying their uh, medicines, walking their dogs, and shopping for groceries. And then it was very important for the youngsters to feel functional during the pandemic lockdowns. The pandemic created a space where people could confront themselves and realize how much of a service they could be for those who were in need inside the community. People were taking care of each other. People were providing masks and shields to one another. It was like a job. It was like a full-time employment. There was a production of different services aiming to assist those who were in a dire need. And in time, it became a significant network of solidarity and cooperation. Solidarity networks were actually supposed to be undertaken by the government, by the state, but we tried to give a response to the people in need who couldn't benefit from the services offered by the state. These are the areas fundamentally expected women to deliver. Women were forced to stay home, but at the same time, do everything that you can think of. Women were suffering from unpaid work at every extent of life. And what Arunj just shared with us is very significant. The white color workers were actually confined in their homes and they couldn't decide what they wanted to do with their lives. And simultaneously, these people were forced to take care of household chores, childcare, cleaning, cooking, and um, washing the dishes. 
they were supposed to be careful about the pandemic, but at the same time, they were supposed to assume responsibilities over the education of their children using uh, online uh, channels. So, in a summarized fashion, the government loaded all the burden of caretaking over the shoulders of women during the pandemic. And the value of unpaid work for women is $10 trillion around the globe. This is the unpaid gains for women all around the world. And this has to change. We are talking about the solidarity network, but with the networks we have created, we wanted to help people to not feel abandoned, to not feel all alone during the pandemic as they were locked down in their homes. We just wanted to extend a helping hand to, the, to those individuals who were feeling isolated. I'm talking about this as a solidarity network because solidarity is reciprocal. You take something, but at the same time, you have to give something back. It doesn't have to be a financial. It doesn't have to be a commodity. Your labor, your emotions, your attachment, your pledge, will always matter in solidarity networks. So this is about helping one another to survive. But unfortunately, the solidarity network we established became a network of assistance. We wanted to surmount these challenges around assistance, but it was not possible, which I will dwell upon in the next few uh, minutes. During the pandemic, Our solidarity network benefited from donations coming from 3,000 people, and it's still expanding. Our network is still expanding. We have 3,000 volunteers, and all of those 3,000 volunteers were suffering from the circumstances surrounding the pandemic. I had an interview with a person whom I needed to purchase a medicine for one of our elderly members. We launched a campaign over Google and there were many uh, volunteers willing to uh, provide these medicines for the elderly member of our community. So I called one of the volunteers and she said, that she was not going to be able to cater to this need of the elderly because of the fact that she was obliged to take care of her own child and her husband. She was also a white collar and she was actually employed in her household in a very extensive fashion. So we have encountered the fact that everybody needed solidarity and everybody needed assistance, even those who are volunteering to help others were in need of assistance. So we exceeded our boundaries as the Kadıköy Solidarity Network. We wanted to provide soup kitchens in our neighborhoods in order to help transform our communities. And in the face of climate crisis and food crisis, we established an urban ecological group. We had the opportunity to come up with certain alternatives in order to furbish people with the vegetables and the fruits that they need within the urban boundaries. We had five or six different uh, solidarity groups on computer literacy, on uh, Childcare. Inside our solidarity networks, through certain donations and through certain pledges, we've managed to cater to the needs of the individuals who were locked down. And in Kadikari, 
Some people were obliged to work even through the pandemic, especially the healthcare workers, and we supported them in the best fashion possible. From the city of Edirne to the city of Chankara, we have allocated our orders and we had dispatched commodities to those who were in need all around Turkey. And we produced masks for those people who were obliged to work, especially in uh, the textiles section. We created masks which could be uh, used multiple times for the people who were supposed to go to the factories, go to the production sites on a daily basis because they couldn't afford disposable masks any longer. We gave defense training programs to especially women. In Kadıköy, we uh, got together with martial arts experts in order for them to give self-defense uh, training programs to men and women. They were flexing their muscles. They were learning how to defend themselves during the dire circumstances of the pandemic. This was very instrumental in allowing people to feel better about themselves because people needed to be involved in something one way or the other. We were talking to people. We were just chatting with them in order to relieve them from their burdens. And we have seen that this was very, very beneficial. And then we had another network whereby we collected old computers, refurbished them, and distributed these computers to children who were supposed to attend their education uh, through online means, such as EBA. EBA is the Remote Educational System of Turkey, which was introduced at the uh, beginning of the pandemic. People were involved in dispatching these computers personally to the children in need, along with uh, cartons of grocery. This is something that we are still doing. We are providing food to those in need all around Turkey. This has been our most prominent activity, at the end of which we try to surmount the challenges surrounding the pandemic. And we considered whether we should leave a message on these uh, grocery bags about the Kadıköy Solidarity Network in order to encourage people to take up action and to help some others after having received help themselves. We had very fruitful examples. As the Kadıköy Solidarity Network, we constructed a house for a woman who was forced to live in the district of Fikirtepe on the Anatolian site. She was living in a sweater house and she had no bathroom, she had no shower. So we launched an appeal to uh, volunteering construct construction workers. And they came to Fikirtepe and they built a house from scratch with a shower, with a kitchen and with all the amenities that a person would need. So we transferred the keys over to this uh, lady and she was overwhelmed. These are our accomplishments, but there are certain failures that I need to mention. I need to uh, talk about the soup kitchens. Soup kitchens were very valuable in terms of the experiences we had garnered. But soup kitchens can only be mobilized in case of a dire need. So we cannot sustain the activities of our soup kitchens indefinitely. We can only continue with our soup kitchens whenever the occasion would ask for it. There are so many people living on the streets. There are so many people uh, who are coming from immigrant backgrounds. We try to talk to the restaurants and the bars and the pubs all around Kadıköy in order to get assistance from them. The more people we had willing to contribute to our activities through cooking, through shopping, or through provision of uh, groceries, we uh, had the chance to expand our activities beyond our wildest 
dreams. We set a schedule for everybody involved to cook and to provide for those who were in need. But we were overwhelmed with the participation of our volunteers. And during the weekends, especially for two day lockdowns, we wanted to make sure that we would have enough food to give to those who were in a dire need and who couldn't get out of their homes because they were not permitted and they were not eligible. Every day we could provide for 100 people. After a while, we wanted to open a physical kitchen to provide for those who were in need, but we didn't have the financial means to do that. And we couldn't find a spot that we could afford. If we had done that, we could have had a collective soup kitchen in the district of Kadikar. So this is an open-ended endeavor, which we will pick up, hopefully, and we will no longer be dormant. One of the fundamental discrepancies of our network was the fact that we couldn't exceed our capabilities beyond assistance. So solidarity disappeared and we became an instrument of assistance and of provision. We were focusing on reciprocity. We were focusing on a distribution of tasks and we were focusing on making sure that everybody had to take action. We became some sort of a foundation where people just donate money and uh, they would relieve themselves accordingly instead of getting personally involved. So we formed a study group in order to identify what we needed to do further in order to provide assistance to those in need in physical terms. So instead of just donating money, we needed people to be physically involved in the provision of uh, services. We also wanted to help the students who couldn't find accommodation in Istanbul once after the academic year uh, was uh, started by the government again. You will remember the pictures of students sleeping in the parks, sleeping in the campuses on the uh, beds that they had that they had uh, brought together with them, complaining about the fact that they couldn't afford the apartments in Istanbul any longer. So we wanted to help them to find accommodation that they could afford. And finally, I would like to uh, say that we are also focusing on environments. In Kadikari district, we don't have many green areas and the per capita green area allocation is becoming even more limited as time goes by. We wanted to convert people's gardens which were available to them into collective gardens for growing vegetables and fruits. Many of our friends with their gardens available to them opened their gardens for uh, Horticulture. And in Moda, uh, in the Moda district of Kadıköy, we uh, created an environment where we could uh, cultivate fruits and vegetables for those in need, free of charge. We planted trees and we planted fruits and vegetables everywhere, but there was a problem. Horticulture is not an easy feat to assume. It's not like growing a plant inside your house or it's not like growing a flower in your pots. So agriculture, horticulture was very difficult to manage. So we have mobilized our capabilities as the members of the network in order to go and water and take care of the gardens that were available for us in the Kadikari district. So this emerged as a new task. So this became a new responsibility. Kadikari Solidarity Network still persists and we have thousands of components which make us 
really strong. We are very driven to make a change. And the fundamental effect that brought us together was the pandemic. The pandemic leading to isolated individuals and the creation of incredible loneliness and incredible abandonment. The networks of solidarity grew neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, district by district. And we need to replicate our accomplishments in order to keep on helping those in need in the post pandemic era, because people will never be able to go back to their circumstances uh, before the pandemic. So their abandonment, their isolation still continues, especially for the elderly members of the community. And finally, I would like to say that I'm thankful to those who have been cooking for the people who didn't know. I'm thankful for the people who have been producing masks inside their homes, who have been producing uh, shields <clears throat> inside their homes, who have opened their gardens to those who were in a dire need. And I would like to thank all those involved in the realization of the Solidarity Network during the darkest days of the pandemic, as they have assumed greater responsibility to uh, provide for those in need. I'm grateful for all of the components, all of the stakeholders of Kadıköy Network. And I would like to conclude my remarks by saying as such. We would like to thank you for your very enthusiastic uh, speech. It was a very inspiring speech. It was a very fast speech. I hope the interpreters uh, didn't find it very difficult and very challenging to interpret. I never wanted to interrupt you because you were talking about beautiful things. Uh, Kadıköy Solidarity Network appears to have very wonderful tasks at hand pointing out to the fact that solidarity is very important in our day and age, which is different than assistance. As I've said before, I will uh, collect your question in the this session. I don't want to interrupt the speakers. You can use YouTube channels in order to uh, provide your questions. And you can also use the chat box on Zoom to uh, ask your questions. I would like to move on to the third speaker without any further ado. During the pandemic and in this matter of solidarity or lack thereof, uh, we check many different groups, but sometimes we forget some of them. And sometimes people with different identities and their needs uh, may be disregarded. Their efforts may also be disregarded. Yunus Kara will be our next speaker, and he will touch upon this issue. Yunus Kara is from the SPOD Association. Let me tell, say a couple of words on Yunus Kara. Yunus Kara is a social worker, a graduate of the Social Services Department of Ankara University. Then he also completed his master's on the same uh, specialty. He is now working on his PhD and he's a research assistant at Altenbosch University. And he's been working at SPOD for uh, five years now. SPOD is a Social Policy, Gender Identity and Sexual Orientation Studies Association. Uh, they deal uh, with heteronormity, uh, employment, and many other topics. And Yunus Kara is an activist working at that association. The floor is yours. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Hello, everyone. Before I start my presentation, I would like to remind you that this is uh, the 20th of November. This is the day to commemorate uh, transgenders who've been subjected to hate crimes. We will not leave anyone behind. We will always commemorate those we lost and we will never lose hope. Our lives are valuable. This is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I'll share with you my presentation. I want to share it with you. If you could allow me, you have uh, the permission to share, but I can't. 
Now I could. Now I could. Thank you. So. I chose this very specific title for my presentation, Becoming Aware of the Presence, uh, in parentheses, question mark, of LGBTI people in the field of care. I have a question mark there because maybe during my presentation we will be able to answer the question of whether uh, the LGBTI plus people are included in the field of care or not. Uh, I will try to look at many different countries in the world, but it won't be possible because many countries in the world do not run an effective process of adding LGBTI plus rights to uh, care. Actually, we published a report in 2020. I was the editor of that group. I will try to touch upon that report and uh, I will also try to share with you some possible solutions. In the introduction, I have just two sentences and these two sentences are sentences that we hear very often regarding LGBTI pluses. LGBTI pluses are subjected to discrimination in many different public arenas, such as home, work, school, hospitals, streets, etc. We're also subjected to prejudice. They're also subjected to prejudice. And this uh, discrimination keeps them away from having access to many different services. I listed housing, education, healthcare, justice, and social services here, but actually it covers all the services that are provided in the uh, public sphere. I've been working uh, at SPOD for about four years now, and I've been working in the field for five years, and I experience this very often myself. How about LGBTI plus uh, rights and their involvement in the care in care work in the world well looking at the studies we see that there are many different reasons regarding challenges that the LGBTI pluses experience when having access to services there are three different categories the first category is limited access as I said before LGBTI plus rights LGBTI plus uh, people are subjected to discrimination in the society and uh, they're uh, isolated from the very first mechanism of socialization which is the family and this of course creates challenges in for them in accessing other services from that point on uh, LGBTI plus youth or adolescents uh, they're kicked out of home by their families this leads them uh, to having no access to education or to uh, work life and they end up having access problems when it comes to care because they're homeless. The second category is negative experiences. The research shows us that LGBTI pluses are subjected to prejudice or discrimination by healthcare professionals uh, when they're trying to access care services. In other words, uh, institutions that have to provide services to LGBTI pluses have no policies on this. And people working at these institutions are not necessarily competent. We have healthcare professionals that are not necessarily competent in how to deal with LGBTI pluses. And since there are such people working at these institutions, when LGBTI pluses take steps to access these services, they're subject to, to discrimination. And just because they have the fear of being suspected, being subjected to discrimination, um, they don't take any further steps to access services later on. And this is very important. Uh, research around the world um, show us that institutions don't always have policies 
in dealing with LGBTI plus people. Some uh, institutions have policies stating that uh, uh, no discrimination is allowed. And uh, yet another important uh, question is whether they start uh, a legal process when uh, people are subjected to discrimination. Or another, uh, con another question is whether uh, there are gender neutral bathrooms for example in institutions aslında baktığınızda iki e, kapsamda değerlendirilebilecek bir şey. E, birincisi zaten the third category is lack of information or lack of knowledge. LGBTI pluses think that healthcare professionals do not have the knowledge to provide them with healthcare services that they need. This is not only true for Turkey, actually. This is true for many countries around the world. This lack of information. And this, of course, creates a lot of problems when it comes to their access to healthcare services. And uh, LGBTIs um, don't have any information regarding um, care services that they can benefit from because they're subjected to multiple forms of discrimination in different systems of the society. They don't have much of an idea about the services that they can have access to. They lack information. Uh, this is a short summary, actually. There are three institutes here. And the research of these three institutes show us actually the inequalities when it comes to LGBTI uh, pluses and the discrimination that they're faced with. LGBTI plus youth, for example, stands uh, two to three uh, stand uh, three times more uh, stand three times more risk of committing suicide. Uh, they stand a two to three times higher risk of ending up homeless. It is considered that 20 to 40 percent of all the homeless youth are LGBTI plus. Moreover, they have a higher risk of being faced with discrimination or bullying. Uh, the the risk of them becoming smokers is much higher than non-LGBTI plus people. Uh, alcohol use, uh, substance use, depression and anxiety are higher among LGBTI pluses as well. This is actually a minority anxiety, as we call it, or a discrimination anxiety. Uh, they have a lower possibility of uh, receiving preventive services against cancer. They experience more behavioral health care problems and uh, trans people experience uh, suicide, exposure to violence, HIV or other STDs much more often. Of course, we're talking about a heter heterogeneous group among the LGBTI plus as well. I mean, trans people are subjected to more discrimination than the other LGBTI groups. Well, older LGBTI people are faced with a higher rate of isolation, uh, lessening social support, and uh, lessened access to social services, especially in the times of the pandemic. Actually, the world started to focus on older LGBTI pluses a bit more than before. Actually, we do not have any public institutions working on this. We have a new NGO called the uh, 17th of May Association working on this. And they're faced with a fourfold increased risk of being subjected to hate discourse, hate speech, or hate crimes. Let me give you some global examples. But as I said before, I'm not going to share with you all the projects uh, run by all the countries in the world. There are only some specific countries that ran some projects. And I want to touch upon those projects. Uh, 
I thought it would make sense to make a comparison with Turkey. I think it is very important that this project in Ontario is run by the School of Social Work. This project is on uh, care services at home. Another project is LGBTI plus healthcare services project. This project aims at minimizing uh, problems to do with access to healthcare for LGBTI plus people because I, as I said before, uh, LGBTI plus people are subjected to discrimination when it comes to STDs or other diseases such as cancer. So this project is very uh, uh, substantial. LGBTI plus uh, aging project is another project. This is a project for the aging LGBTI uh, to make them more visible in the public sphere and to in include them more in the institutional system. The Trevor project is a project that I find very important. As I said before, LGBTI plus youth are usually denied by their families. They're, they're kicked out of home. That's why they face uh, housing problems. This is very common in Turkey. From a social work point of view, uh, we uh, receive a lot of demand from LGBTI plus people regarding housing. Uh, that is why I find this project to be very important and this actually should be done in the public sphere by uh, the government but these projects are run by NGOs that's something we should question capstone project capstone project is very uh, much like the healthcare services project yes LGBTI people uh, have difficulty accessing healthcare services, but what's the next step? Because this project aims at creating a policy and um, this is a policy that aims at um, designing everything accordingly. Another project is LGBTI plus inclusive and positivity project. As I said before, professionals don't have enough experience with LGBTI plus people. They don't know exactly what to do in practice. This is not only true for Turkey, but other countries as well. Um, uh, professional associations should organize trainings and maybe prepare pamphlets for uh, their for their professional groups on how to uh, deal with LGBTI plus people. Uh, there is actually a, a booklet that I'm working on and that I'm the editor of. This is very similar to our work, therefore. In Turkey, the situation is a bit bleak because as I said before, our association has a report on uh, social services access by the LGBTI plus people during the pandemic. So we looked at housing, social assistance, psychosocial support, and access to support mechanisms after violence. Uh, this report is available in Turkish and in English. If you send me an email, I can send you the report, or you can find it online. Well, um, we divided Turkey into seven geographical regions uh, and we chose seven cities with a very high population. And we send this form, we send an online form to public institutions. 
So we focused on these seven cities, but we asked them to write down the district uh, or the neighborhood uh, that they live in in those cities, because this was important uh, from the point of view of institutions that they're trying to have access to, because they live in a certain neighborhood and maybe they don't have access to those services in that specific neighborhood. And we gathered data between the 17th of April 2020 and the 21st of May 2020. So just a couple of uh, months after the pandemic started in Turkey. Data collection lasted only one month, but our results are the, the outcome of the report shows us that this is this wasn't limited. I mean, these problems were not limited to the pandemic. They just became more visible during the pandemic. Of course, we had to write down uh, the period during which uh, we gathered the data. And here we, uh, we had 856 LGBTI plus respondents. Let's have a look at the sample that we had. Here you see gender identity and orientation, sexual orientation, sexual identity and sexual orientation. You know, the sample is diverse. Of course, we wish it was a bit more uh, equally distributed. There are many different identities and orientations. Let's have a look at the age brackets. There are more people between the ages of 18 and 25. And as I said before, I wish there were more people from uh, the higher age bracket because we want to learn more about uh, what people uh, of an older age experience. And again, the education level was not equally distributed. We wish it was. So one of the basic questions was whether they were working with LGBTI plus people. Uh, we asked them whether they were working actually, and uh, 312 of them said they were working, but more than half of them, more than half of the respondents were unemployed. People with no income, I mean, 458 out of 800 something respondents did not have any income at all. And then, you know, 40 people were making 200 liras to 1000 liras per month. I mean, this is actually the allowance that those people got from their parents because they considered it to be an income, it's not their salary. Okay, let's move on to housing. About housing, let me give you a short summary about housing. Most of the LGBTI pluses that uh, who participated in the uh, survey said they didn't know how to access social services. They believe that they will be subjected to discrimination. So as a solution, they chose to go live with their families or with their friends. But let me go into the details. Out of the 856 respondents, 82 said they had housing problems. We asked them whether they applied to any institution for their uh, housing needs. 70 said no, 12 said yes. 70 said no, and this is important. For example, one of the respondents, I mean, many respondents, of course, shared with us their experience, but one of them said the following. I had made enough money to leave the house where I was subjected to violence, but it was very difficult for me to get my stuff from uh, home. Um, I called violence hotlines, but I believe that if I call the police, my family will get even madder and nobody is going to protect me. Actually, this person was scared of their family. That's why they didn't even apply. 
for housing. So there's a housing problem, and we asked the 12 responders, respondents who said that they applied to an institution, which institutions they applied to. Uh, well, we divided to them into different categories, uh, governor's office, district governor's office, social service, institution, social work centers, uh, the village head's office, uh, consulates, municipalities. Um, they didn't get any support. Just one person said, I'm still waiting for an answer. And you see the names of the institutions uh, that didn't support them. So this shows us uh, from which institutions they can't get support and which services have to be developed at those institutions. Well, social assistance is yet another important matter. It's still the same here because during the pandemic, LGBTI pluses, that is most of them, didn't even know where to apply to for social assistance. And they're afraid that they may be subjected to violence due to their sexual identity or orientation, and that is why they asked France for help. So let's have a look at details. There are 278 participants who said they needed social assistance, and we asked them whether they applied to any institution, and 138 said no, we didn't apply to any social aid institution. Uh, one of them said, uh, I don't meet the criteria for application. I don't want to expose myself to institutions. I can't face, uh, I can't risk being discriminated against in these difficult times. This is a very key sentence when it comes to accessing uh, social assistance. We asked them which institutions they applied to. And you can see the name of the institution on the right. Many people didn't receive any support. A limited number of them, actually eight, 16 people got some uh, form of support. Uh, only a few are still waiting for an answer. And um, my experience also shows me that people wait because these institutions are busy and they wait and wait and they don't get a response. And here again, on the right hand side, you see the names of the institu institutions that didn't provide that support. Psychosocial support. Well, as I said before, um, people had negative experiences, they didn't have enough information, uh, most of the LGBTI pluses didn't have an idea about which institutions to apply to. And this is critical, you know, they lack information and uh, they can't announce services. And they believe that they can be subjected to discrimination and they're concerned about a possible lack of confidentiality. They're concerned about possible negative attitude of institutions. And they say that they didn't know that these services could be free of charge. Uh, therapy is not free of charge, and I think that's what they mean. And they almost never apply to any public institution anyway. Out of the 856 respondents, 394 of them said they need psychosocial support. This is a very critical figure because apparently they felt trapped during the pan pandemic, uh, and this was aggravated by discrimination. Well, you know, in uh, the East, LGBTI pluses were seen as the reason behind the pandemic. So there was a lot of negative discourse against the LGBTI plus people. The Religious Affairs Presidency in Turkey and many other public institutions too uh, took up such 
a, a, a discourse. And we asked them whether they apply to any institution. 116 said no, 278 said yes. And those who didn't apply said they don't think support will work. They're concerned about the support that they will get from uh, the government. They don't want to be exposed. And they lack self-confidence and they can't pay the fee, no matter how uh, small the fee is. And I think that one of the biggest concerns here is that their identity may be exposed. They're very much concerned about this. 278 respondents said they applied to an institution or another. And here again, you see um, a list of institutions. Those people who applied to the Ministry of Health, they got support because there was a SABIM, uh, Ministry of Health uh, Communication Center hotline from which they could support, especially during the pandemic. They couldn't get any support from other institutions. 151 people got support from uh, civil society organizations or foundations. And here you see the name of those CSOs. This actually shows us that most of the burden lies with the NGOs when it comes to providing uh, psychosocial support to the LGBTI plus people. Uh, let's have a look at access to support mechanisms after violence. I showed you before that LGBTI plus people run a four times higher risk of being uh, subjected to violence than non-LGBTI plus people. Uh, so LGBTI people say they are um, scared that there is impunity, uh, that public institutions use hate speech against them, uh, that they are scared that they may be subjected to discrimination. And they're afraid of negative attitudes as well. Uh, well, uh, they uh, complain about transphobia and they say people don't believe them. So this is actually, this was actually a pandemic that required compulsory return to home for many of the LGBTI plus people. They didn't have the financial means, so they had to go back and live with their families. Apparently they don't feel safe with their families and actually uh, this is critical uh, because uh, they've been subjected to violence by their families. Can you please wrap up? Because you ran out of time. Okay, okay, thank you, I will. In terms of access, we have asked our participants whether they were exposed to violence or not. And we have seen that they could be exposed to violence in different forms. There are many, many, many forms of violence that they could be exposed to. And uh, there are many comments here that you can see on the right hand side of this slide that their families don't listen to them. The police would uh, impose violence upon them. So there are so many different experiences. And here, I find this to be quite important. I have asked 18 participants whether they have received support after violence and many of them said they didn't receive any support after violence I, we also asked about their attitudes vis-a-vis -vis the services they had received during the pandemic and we wanted to underline the fact that the state was not giving enough information to the lgbt members of the community 
olmadığını düşünmeliyiz. And we just wanted to uh, explore whether there were mechanisms of assistance for the LGBT and members of the community during the pandemic. <clears throat> and this slide clearly shows that during the pandemic, no services were allocated for the LGBT members of the community. These are fundamental services, of course, that they, the LGBT cannot have access to. We need basic access to uh, services provided by the government, provided by the state. It's quite clear that the LGBT need to have access to services provided by the state to the uh, entire Turkish society. Another complaint that we receive quite frequently is about the safe and uh, temporary accommodation provided by the state during the pandemic for the LGBT. LGBT members are not allowed in shelter homes because they don't have the identities. They are left outside. I'm not going to dwell upon the details more than necessary, but the LGBT uh, members of the community cannot have access to shelter, accommodation, psychological and uh, physical assistance. We need to create support networks in order to help the LGBT in Turkey. And I have taken so much of your time. I'm sorry for my very uh, expeditious presentation. Well, thank you so much, Yunus Kara. You have given us a great perspective on the challenges experienced by the LGBT when it comes to care. You have shared with us the details of the research and I would like to thank you for this. For those who would like to read this uh, research in detail, I think they can apply to SPOT. Yes, we have it on the website. You can download it and you can read it. Now I am going to collect your questions. We have exceeded our time, but all of our three speakers can receive your questions now. Fenar, Nevruz, and Yunus. If you have any questions, Um, to all speakers and to the moderator. I would like uh, to ask one question you already mentioned, um, especially, I guess, um, the first speaker, Pina um, Ogunj, um, because you were asking, what does it need uh, that makes solidarity last? And I would be interested, you mentioned, for example, this uh, topic of the hospital with this doctor who was very much engaged in his field. Do you ob observe um, kind of uh, sustainable actions or structural changes, for example, in the hospital that you mentioned or in other yeah, spheres, like that people, uh, that, that you see changes that benefit for your work as well? Any other questions for Pernara Unch? By the way, if you are asking questions, I would like you to turn over to the cameras so that your faces can be recorded. Any other questions for the, uh, O anlattığım doktor uh, Pelin'in hikayesi uh, iki uh, açıdan önemliydi. Well, Bir tanesi... The doctor that I was speaking about was very important in two dimensions. First, nasıl uh, süreci etkilediğini aktar. They were crucial in terms of identifying the ramifications of gender uh, politics on providing services during the pandemic. This was a period where the healthcare workers were excessively unexperienced under the circumstances of the pandemic. And we saw that male doctors could swear quite confidently under tensions. There was a great deal of aggression and uh, male doctors were suffering from 
working so much, not being able to see their families, not being able to see their children, so that they were eligible. They were entitled to swear all they want. They were using this as a pretext. Well, many female workers supported this doctor because they said that, okay, he's worn out, he's working so much, so he has the right to swear and curse on everybody else. But this is not acceptable. Many examples were given during the speeches, uh, pointing out to the fact that the healthcare workers, especially male, during the um, crisis moments, during the challenging moments, they are much less resilient. They are much less tolerant, and they were using these pressuring moments to exert additional pressure on female healthcare workers. The uh, violence against healthcare workers are not diminishing. On the contrary, they are rising, and we are watching these footages proving the fact. And this is as far as we know. Nothing has changed in my example's life. But the breaking point came when she started establishing different natured relations with the victimized individuals of the society, such as the asylum seekers and the immigrants. She was trying to push the boundaries of the hospitals and she wanted to help the immigrants and the uh, asylum seekers where she heard from the administration of the hospital that she was giving them too much uh, access and that she was going to cause them additional trouble. She was pushing her boundaries, but she was being blamed for giving so much access to immigrants and asylum seekers inside the hospital. When she decided to create the solidarity network, she felt the need to, to get out of the closed environment provided by the hospital, provided by the net neighborhood that she was living in. She wanted to get out of that enclosed environment so that she could have easier access to establishing relations with the poor families and the immigrant families. We are all assuming risks. We are all doing something, but we need to do more, was what she said. She was willing to take more risks in order to extend the helping hand to those who were in need. Otherwise, she was prohibited by the institutions that they were bound by. She thought she would be relieved more if she could carry a cup of soup to an elderly member of the society who couldn't get out during the pandemic. Or she felt more relieved and more confident if she could extend the helping hand to a uh, to an immigrant family during the pandemic who had no rights and no access to any services whatsoever. So these were the confrontations leading to her moments of breakthrough. She was deeply impacted by these breakthrough moments whereby she defined her relations with the rest of the world. She started taking care of the outside world more than herself. She found value in taking care of the outside world instead of herself only. She felt that she was a part of life. She felt that she was an important figure. This is very critical, actually, during the pandemic, especially in Turkey. This is what we had experienced. And the political climate that we are bound by leads to people feeling invisible. People's problems are not heard, are not articulated properly. So in order to surmount that, in order to become more visible, people have to take individual action. But individually, you cannot be visible. You need to create networks collectively in order to be heard, in order to be seen. 
uh, one, and this is a conference which is an outstanding example for this. We have another question in the room, so I would like to give the floor over to them. Hello, hello. My question will be for Yunus Kara. Your presentation was very important. The problems encountered by the LGBT plus members of the society during the pandemic will help our students to become much more aware. And I would like to thank you for that. Let me ask you, since yesterday, we have been handling the concept of care through different perspectives. And we are discussing whether we could have a new vision of care after the pandemic. So I would like to ask you, the different social networks during the pandemic for the LGBT plus, have they emerged? What kind of observations do you have? What kind of networks have emerged during the pandemic for the LGBT plus? Well, thank you so much. Duygu and Shimshek will take the floor in this conference after me. That's why I don't want to bother you with the details when necessary, but LGBT plus members need to invest in the solidarity dynamic amongst themselves, especially after the pandemic. And we need to know what the other one is doing. It's not about the services, it's not about the consultancy that we provide, but we need to be aware of one another and we couldn't be left abandoned. We should not feel alone. So with this reality, we created a network which was very valuable. And certain things have evolved, actually. We are organizing much more enlightening and informing conferences with the participation of the LGBT+. And we are trying to provoke interest in terms of the problems encountered by the LGBT+, members of the community during and after the pandemic. But I know that we are uh, still not there, not quite there. I would like to ask a question to Nevrus Troche Özçeli. Kadıköy Solidarity Network has been through a learning process during the pandemic, was what you said. I appreciate that. And many things have self-transformed during the pandemic. So what kind of lessons have you learned? Can we become a little bit more critical in terms of sustainability? What can you say, especially for those who were involved in the organization of the Kadıköy Solidarity Network? Were they keen on solidarity or were they just merely involved because of extraordinary circumstances surrounding our country? as well as the other countries around the globe. Were they mobilized for one thing or the other, resulting in self-transformation? Well, it's impossible for me to talk about a single uh, dynamic, but ever since the Gezi protest in Kadıköy, there had been a sense of moving together. The manifestos, the protests that we were involved in during uh, the Gezi Park uh, incidents led to us to get together fast and led to us getting together quite strongly. This is a very well established culture in Kadıköy. Whenever something happens, we can expeditiously communicate with one another and we can organize quite fast. And during the uh, gov uh, local government's elections, we had seen examples whereby we got together so fast in order to cast our votes. We used to have the no assemblies where we objected to the things that were imposed upon us. So we are sensitive and we have a network who's reacting against these sensitivities. But during the pandemic, we've managed to get together with people who were not conventionally involved in such 
assistance networks. They found themselves in such a community that they felt confident, that they felt some sort of an assistance. These people who were not involved in any network whatsoever previously started to manage their uh, social media and managed to extend the helping hand to those in need. In the social uh, networks, we had people involved in the distribution of uh, food provided by the soup kitchens to those in need. So this was unprecedented. They were volunteering, but they were actually involved in all of these activities during the pandemic, which was a uh, first time for all of us. And here, there are certain dynamics we can change and we cannot change. Civil society is a concept that people approach both from a, a positive perspective and a negative perspective. And here, we wanted to eradicate that kind of an approach through allowing people to assist those in need in a confident fashion. There were people who couldn't face themselves and who couldn't agree with the fact that they could be instrumental in terms of extending a helping hand to those in need during dire circumstances. We just wanted to fight against the indiscrepancies offered by the state, offered by the government during crisis times. And we allowed people to feel that they could fill in these indiscrepancies with whatever means that they had at hand. That could be improved further in Kadıköy because every incident brings us together and we move together. We have a community here who is willing to move together, who is willing to get together in order to respond to crises, wherever they emerge. And whenever we encounter challenges introduced by deep poverty, we are ready to get together. We are ready to move together. And what we have achieved since the beginning of the pandemic is that we have decided to sustain our activities as Kadiko Solidarity Group because we are in the know of the fact that whenever a new crisis would emerge, we would still be needed. People would still need us and we needed to protect this structure. I would like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, we would like to conclude this session I saw a comment on YouTube. It's a comment on the negligence of the elderly members of the society. We are not exclusively focusing on certain groups, but instead we are uh, discussing the topic of care in a wider perspective. We are not necessarily highlighting disabled care or child care or the elderly care. Instead, we are talking about the uh, responsibility of care as a social obligation, as a social obligation and a responsibility. That's why we are focusing on a wider perspective. That's why we are not confining our discussions within the boundaries of a certain society. Of course, just like children, just like the LGBT+, plus, just like uh, women, we are also talking about the elderly members of the society who are in need of care. Other than this, I have seen no questions. I would like to conclude, that, conclude this session by announcing something. For those who are following us on YouTube, you cannot watch our uh, YouTube broadcast of yesterday right now because of certain limitations regarding intellectual property rights. We had played certain music which brought us to a point where our broadcast was uh, prohibited entirely. Once after we deal with this issue, we will be available for your uh, viewing.
we are going to give a break for one hour and after the lunch break, we will get together with you. Thank you.
Evet, merhabalar tekrar. Bugün dokuzuncusunu yaptığımız pandemi merceğinden bakım tartışmaları başlıklı dokuzuncu sosyal hizmet konferansımızın beşinci oturumuna başlayacağız. Bu oturumda üç tane konuşmamız, beş tane konuşmacımız var gördüğünüz gibi. E, hibrit konferansımızın bu oturumunda bütün konuşmacılarımız salonumuzda. E, ben önce e, bütün oturumlarda yaptığımız gibi kısaca konuşmacılarım. First, just like in the other uh, sessions, I will briefly introduce our speakers and then give the floor over to them. The first speaker is Hacer Fogo. <clears throat> Hacer Fogo has been focusing on deep poverty quite recently, and she's been a recognizable uh figure and for the last 15 years or more she has been a journalist and an author in the field of human rights she is especially uh, focusing on advocacy for the rights of the roman communities and during the pandemic with her friends She has established a network on deep poverty and she has become a pioneer figure in terms of fighting deep poverty. You have the floor, Hajar, and I will remind you when we are about to run out of time. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to pandemiden sonra bu da arttı ve aslında sizlere çok ihtiyaç var bu ülkenin. Umarım e, bu konferansa da sizin ve sizlerin ve hocalarımızın kıymetinin daha fazla bilineceğini e, umut ediyorum. Çünkü sosyal hizmetsiz herhalde yoksulluğun e, azalacağını e, tartışmak mümkün bile değil. Ben e, 15 yılı aşkın Hocamın da söylediği gibi gazetecilik yaptım ama o dönemde de hep insan hakları alanında çalıştım. Yoksulluk alanında, işçi sendika haberleri yaptım. Ve sonrasında 2006 yılında e, hepinizin bildiği gibi Sulu Kule'de bir kentsel dönüşüm ilan edildi. Ve orada bin yıllık bir roman mahallesi vardı biliyorsunuz ve o tamamen yıkıldı. Niye e, bu konuyu söylüyorum? Çünkü aslında benim yoksullukla ve yoksullarla e, daha yakından temas etmem ve yoksulluğu anlamam biraz da e, o süreçle ilgiliydi. Kentsel dönüşüm için gittim ve orada e, yaklaşık beş yıl aktivist olarak çalıştım ama o hanelerin içerisine girdiğim zaman işte engellileri yakından tanıdım, çocuk yoksulluğunu gördüm ve o çocukların, çocuklar ve kadınlar beni çok etkilemişti. Çünkü o çocuklar Okul sonrası e, evlerine döndükleri zaman yaşadıkları tramva, evimiz yıkıldı mı, buradan nereye taşınacağız tramvası. E, orada bizim kentsel dönüşümle ilgili mücadelemiz sürerken orada bir çocuklarla ilgili merkez kurmamızı ama o merkez dediğimiz şey aslında yarı yıkık binalarda belki işte bir e, resim defteri, boya kalemle başladığımız süreç bizi... Ee, ve beni ve arkadaşlarımı 2016 yılında Çimenev adlı bir çocuk merkezini kurmama e, götürdü. Ve biz Çimenev'de çocuklar ve kadınlarla 2016 yılında çalışmaya başladığımız zaman çocukların okul devamsızlığıyla ilgili e, yine sosyoekonomik olarak risk altında olan çocuklar ve kadınlar ve annelerle birlikte e, 2000 <gülüyor> 20 yılında bildiğiniz gibi pandemi patladı ve biz e, bütün o çalışmalarımızı aslında gıdaya çevirdik. Nasıl çevirdik? İşte 11 Mart'ta evde kal süreci başladığı zaman aileler işte e, yani 15-20 yıldır İstanbul'un çeşitli mahallelerinde e, birlikte çalışma yaptığımız aileler bizi aramaya başladı ve dediler ki evde gıda yok. Bir başkası aradı dedi ki bebek bezi yok, mama yok. 
Ee, ve bizim için de aslında şok edici zamanlardı. Çünkü birdenbire yoksulluk, e, gıdaya erişememe sorununa dönüştü. Açlığa dönüştü. Ve biz ne yapabiliriz diye düşündüm. Sizin gibi genç arkadaşlarımla birlikte Çimen Ev'de gönüllülük yapan Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nden e, yoğun olarak <gülüyor> öğrenci ve mezun arkadaşlarla birlikte evden değiştir kampanyası başlattık. Ve 18 Mart'ta yani kapanmadan neredeyse 6 gün sonra e, bunu başlattık ve e, en yakın çevremizdeki insanlarla bizim tanıdığımız e, işte kağıt toplayıcı, müzisyen, e, sosyal güvenceden yoksun, günlük çalışan güvencesiz ailelere gıda göndermeye başladık. Online alışverişle biz göndermedik. Destekçilerimiz yakın çevremizdeki destekçilerimiz gö göndermeye başladı. Our supporters from a vicinity started supplying these families with food during the lockdown. And then in time we started providing them with uh, tablet computers with um, derin yoksulluk dediğimiz aslında çocuğu eating mechanisms. Deep poverty turned into a significant level of famine. These groups of people lacked their fundamental needs on a daily basis. They were thinking about what to eat on that day. They were thinking about whether they would be able to afford their rents or not. And they were concerned about whether they would be able to get their medicines or not. And they were also deeply concerned about the possibility of affording diapers and formulas for their babies or not. They were trying to survive on a daily basis, and this was an intergenerational poverty that they suffered from. This was an inherited poverty transferred from one generation to another. Halil and Neslan were the children that I was working with <coughs> in the year 2006. But they had grown up, they had their own babies and they had become paper collectors just like their fathers and mothers. So this is the inherited poverty that I was trying to mention. These children whom I've known in the year 2016 came back to me with their own children, with their own married lives in the year 2020 who were still in dire need of assistance. Once after the lockdown, we stepped into the field and we launched a research. We have surveyed 103 households in order to shed a light on the urgency of the matter at hand. Ataşehir, Beyoğlu, Çekmeköy, Şişli, Ümraniye, Avcılar, Esenyurt, Üsküdar, Sancaktepe, Sultan Gazi, and Sultan Bayli were the districts where we conducted this uh, public poll, where we saw that there was a significant lack of access to food and fundamental services. 64% of the people we surveyed were working on uh, daily chores. 23% of them lacked any remunerations and they had an average income of 800 liras per month. They were paper collectors, they were musicians, and they were uh, cleaners. Textil işçileri, yüzde sekizi temizlik işçileri, yüzde yedisi seyyar satıcı, çiçekçi ve yüzde üçü müzisyen bir e, gruptu. Yüzde doksan sekizinin e, herhangi bir meslek örgütüne üyeliği bulunmadığını e, anladık. Yine aslında en çarpıcı şey e, çocukların e, pandemiyle birlikte yüzde on üçünün e, çalışmaya başladı. Bit was that with the pandemic, 13% of the children started working, and and only in six percent of the families, children were generating revenues for the entire family. When I went to visit a mother, I saw she had two children between the ages of 12 and 13. The children were expected to come back home at four o'clock in the afternoon. I asked what the big child was doing. 
And she said she's looking for a job. She was employed in a supermarket before the pandemic, but with the pandemic, he was unemployed. And that he was now willing to work again. And uh, I believe it was 10 to 4, he walked into a house with a bag in his hand. What can you make out of a child? He, a child would smile, a child would be happy, he would be jumping coming back home. But instead, I saw an old man trying to make a living for his family. He just gave the bag to his mother and he just sat down on one corner of the sofa. So we have hundreds of families trying to make a living under these dire circumstances. And 74% of the families we surveyed couldn't afford diapers and baby formula. When we shared our findings on social media, some people criticized us. Many of the uh, mothers couldn't breastfeed their children any longer. That's why they had to buy formula to feed their babies. But the formulas were very expensive. That, that's, that's why they couldn't have access to the formulas. Instead, many families I know tried to feed their babies with sugared water and uh, wheat uh, paste. And we saw many families trying to use plastic bags instead of diapers, as diapers were inaccessible. We wrote certain declarations in order to alert masses to the dire circumstances these people were living in. If children were supposed to work in these families instead of attending schools, it meant significantly that these children were going to inherit that poverty that plagued the entire family for many generations. We could have launched an activity to ensure the children would attend schools further than the pandemic, but that never came to be. Two percent of women didn't have access to um, hygiene pets during the pandemic. And they didn't have access to social centers. Um, one of the mothers said, we can't defend ourselves against the state. There are uh, different types of aid, but we can't benefit from them. Uh, I applied for COVID support three or four times, and it was denied each and every time, and my husband gets mad. I go there to social services, to the um, district governor's office, and they scold you there, or they belittle you. I called them, and I asked them whether my aid has been approved or not, and the woman said, why do you keep calling? We have other businesses too. She shouted at me, and I didn't say anything to her. I just wanted to know whether I was going to get some assistance or not. And um, I told her that I couldn't go there um, because of COVID. And she said, don't call and uh, bother us again. So I got offended. I'm, I'm 30 years old. I got offended by this language. I heard this from many different people. I'm sure students of social work discuss this with their professors as well. The discourse or the language on poverty should be rediscussed region by region, uh, neighborhood by neighborhood, because there are many different hotlines, you know, and sometimes people give them a certain answer which makes them feel shame or humiliation. They feel bad, especially during the crisis and this increased during the crisis. You may have noticed 
that in front of the district governor's office or in front of the municipalities, you see a lot of people who are there asking for help. Almost 90% of all these people are women. Um, what I hear from women when I talk to them is that husbands are uh, angrier. Uh, they will have some kind of clash there. But women, even if they're humiliated, they still have to go there for their children because they want to receive some rations or coal to burn, and that will help them save the day. And during the pandemic, people complained a lot about politicians and uh, they felt as if uh, they were in limbo because they didn't have access to food and children don't want toys. Uh, they want food. And especially single mothers feel very bad and they say they only come and visit us before elections. Nobody checks whether we're hungry or not, whether we're starving or not. And uh, there's another fact that I witness very often. Uh, there's a family uh, whose livelihood is uh, collecting paper. They didn't even have water during the pandemic. They live in a very small house with one or two rooms and uh, they contracted COVID. They need food to strengthen their immunity, but many municipalities didn't support them. They weren't given access to fresh water or food in spite of the fact that they were sick and poverty in a way uh, creates its own strategy they skip meals for example that's what they said they skip meals uh, they wake up late so they try to go through the day by eating with only one meal. This is a strategy that they developed on their own. Uh, and one of them said, I owe to the uh, grocers, so they no longer give me any goods. Uh, I find a lot of thrown away uh, fruits and vegetables and the neighbors know uh, how bad my situation is. Sometimes they bring us food, or sometimes I find things in the garbage. A family that I've been visiting for a very long time got poisoned because of the chicken they found in garbage. There was another family. Uh, there are certain hours in supermarkets, you know, like afternoon hours. You go there and uh, they place expired products next to uh, the garbage cans or uh, they're not necessarily expired, but they're about to expire. They used to do this and families used to share uh, those almost expired products at the supermarkets. But uh, garbage collection has been banned by uh, the governor's office in Istanbul. They used to make 50 or 60 liras per day. They now can't make it e either. And they can hardly get the goods that the markets throw away. And 38.7% of all households skip meals. 49% said they didn't have access to drinking water um, during the pandemic. And, you know, in Istanbul, you have to buy water to drink. They were only buying water for their babies because the doctors said uh, tap water could cause gut infections. And somebody else said the following. Uh, 
In the past, we didn't skip any meals, but now we skip meals. And every morning I wake up and think about what to find to eat. We wake up quite late, so we skip meals, we skip breakfasts, and we just eat one meal per day. These are all strategies that are developed by poor people. And this also shows how uh, little trust they have in uh, the politicians. Um, so they're left to their own means and they develop their own strategies. Moreover, uh, most of the families that we talk to live in shanty towns or tents. And they say, well, we live in tents, so don't ask us about the earthquakes. When the owner comes, we will have to leave. We all moved here during urban transformation. Uh, the, our houses didn't have deeds. That's why we had to move here. We don't know where to go from here. We built this tent here and we'll live here. Actually, being poor means you don't have a future. You're scared about your future and you believe that your poverty will never end. Today is World Children's Day, the International Children's Day. And there are children who experience deep poverty. I don't ask them what they want to become when they grow up because they have no answer. There's no role model in that neighborhood. So that cycle keeps repeating itself. I witnessed something in Ulobugaz in a class. I was there visiting schools together with the district governor, the teachers, etc. And teacher, I mean, whoever asked the question, uh, they said they want to have that person's profession. For example, the teacher asked them what they want to become, and they said they wanted to become teachers. And then when the prosecutor asked them what they want to become, they said prosecutor. So they see this as a task inside the classroom, but when you go to the neighborhoods, there's no answer to any one of those questions. I hope children will not inherit poverty thanks to young people like you. Thank you. Thank you, Hajar Fogo. I forgot to share with you the title of her presentation. Uh, Looking from the depth of poverty was the title of her presentation. Many families uh, with whom I worked uh, evolved from poverty to starvation during the pandemic. Um, and Hajer shared with us her own observations from poor neighborhoods uh, during the pandemic. I'm not going to take too much of your time, but I just want to add a couple of words. had a research on people who received social aids from different social uh, work bodies, from municipalities, etc. And we also looked into their profiles uh, during the months of June, July, and August. And our findings are very similar to what Hajar found. Uh, we didn't know who to talk to. We weren't allowed into institutions, she said. And my finding was the following. Uh, social work centers at the local uh, authorities started receiving more applications during the pandemic. And the profile of the applicants changed as well. The experts that we talked to, the social workers that we talked to, told us that they received an immense number of applications and some of those applications came from people who were already receiving assistance but the assistance they received became less and less sufficient during the pandemic and then they received a lot of applications from people who do not have regular income people like uh, flower sellers or um, street sellers etc and in some neighborhoods uh, 
hairdressers, uh, bus drivers, or teachers working at private schools also join this list. So our survey was from the perspective of people who provided services. Uh, and I wanted to share with you that our findings were similar. So I took only two minutes. That's all from me. Now we will move on to our second speaker. We have two people from Young LGBT uh, Izmir. Let me introduce them briefly. We have Duygu Yayla. Duygu Yayla is uh, Duygu Yayla graduated from Ege University Sociology Department in 2005. Then she had her master's degree in sociology from Marmara University and uh, She's been working as an activist at the LGBTI uh, community group at her university since her days as a student. And then she became one of the founders of Young LGBTI uh, Association and she became a coordinator as well. And now she works at the uh, social work directorate of Istanbul Metropolitan Municipality and she still volunteers at Young LGBTI. Our second speaker is Shimsheki Tujel. Shimsheki Tujel is also from Ege University, uh, this time from the psychology department. He graduated in 2016 and then he completed his master's degree on family counseling in 2019. I don't know which name you use, Shimshek or Yeet. I'll call you Shimshek Yeet anyways. Shimshek Yeet. has been working in the LGBTI NGOs since his years as a student and he also works on providing social psychosocial support at the Young LGBTI Association and he is the psychosocial support coordinator at the Young LGBTI Association. There presentation's title is the journey of the LGBTI plus community during and after the pandemic and the solidarity praxis. So they will take up from where Yunus Kaya left in the morning and they will share with us their experience. The floor is yours. Hello everyone. Um, well, as Yunus said, uh, the 20th of November is uh, the commemoration day uh, for trans people who lost their lives to hate crimes. I find this coincidence to be meaningful, by the way. Uh, in our work, we focused on uh, some subgroups in the LGBTI plus community. And as Yunus said, um, trans people are subjected to multi-layered and cross-sectional discrimination the most. Today, I will focus on a survey that we conducted very similar to that of uh, SPOD. Um, this survey uh, was conducted in May and June 2020, so our data will be complementary to the data that Yunus presented in the morning. I won't have much time, but you uh, can find uh, the full results of our work on our website. Well, um, during the pandemic, we tried to put meaning to the sudden changes that we were experiencing because disadvantaged groups uh, experience more uh, negative uh, experiences. And that's why we decided to conduct this survey. We checked certain areas such as housing, economic situation, uh, 
violence, etc. So we wanted to identify the problems that they were experiencing and Uh, we also wanted to make their demands visible again. As I said before, this was an online survey. There were 252 participants. There was at least one participant from each province in Turkey, 81 provinces in total. So this participation, I mean, th this base was even larger than we thought. But uh, most of the profile came from Izmir, actually, and most people were university students or young university graduates, young adults. And most of them uh, lived in uh, metropolitan uh, areas. Most of them were not intersex. I briefly told you about their age and educational background. 88% of these participants or respondents were young, according to international standards. And most of these people are middle class. Uh, please keep in mind these two parameters because uh, the rest of the data uh, will be more meaningful if you keep it in mind. Only 6% are intersex. The remaining uh, respondents are not intersex. Most of them define themselves as either men, women, or non-binary. Maybe I should tell you a bit about non-binary. As you know, in social sciences, um, gender groups were limited. But if you ask open-ended questions, then you uh, start hearing about more definitions, which is good. We had a limited number of trans respondents. That's understandable, because from a gender inequality perspective, uh, trans people have limited access to technological tools or to the internet. And moreover, most of the participants were gay or bisexual. Um, let's have a look at their health. And most of them reported that they didn't have any disabilities. Most of them, again, didn't have any chronic diseases, they said. Uh, we didn't look into the subgroup of people with chronic diseases, though, so maybe they're subjected to even more discrimination. 85% uh, of the students had uh, health care insurance, and most of these people are students. The remaining 15% are already in the labor force and they do not have health in healthcare insurance. We have to research and see why. We ask them questions about access to healthcare services because as you know, during the pandemic, outpatient clinics, I mean, most of them were shut down and emergency rooms were full of people and uh, all these developments blocked uh, or hindered access to healthcare services. We just wanted to see whether there are specific healthcare services that the LGBTI people didn't have access to. One of the important issues here is that routine controls were skipped. Uh, therefore, there were problems to do with access to prescriptions and psychiatrist uh, sessions uh, were hindered as well. This is important because for many trans people, uh, it is a legal obligation. If they started the reassignment process. Uh, let me say a couple of words on uh, their uh, mental health. 32% uh, of the participants said their uh, mood was negatively affected. We asked them 
how they viewed themselves before the pandemic and how they view themselves after the pandemic and most of them had a more negative perception after the pandemic This negative development had to do with contagion and loss mostly, but at the same time they lived a very isolated life, deprived of all social support, and it brought about a more depressive mood. The participants reported this in open-ended questions as well, which I will share with you in a minute. We asked them whether they were getting any psychological support or if they needed. And they said before the pandemic, I mean, when we look at the figures before and after the pandemic, there is a change. Before the pandemic, there were more people getting support. And I'm referring to the lockdowns, by the way, when I say pandemic. During the first lockdown, the psychological support was lost. And this support was mostly lost in public institutions. The private sector sustained uh, psychological support to a certain extent. So the biggest problem was that they had to stay with their families or they had to go back home involuntarily. Because if they haven't opened up to their families, uh, their life all of a sudden requires a lot of self-control. Uh, or uh, they've already come out and uh, they're exposed to discrimination or violence. And that has a negative impact on their mood. And then there are people who said our mood or mental health changed positively. It's important to share this as well. Uh, some people said, I mean, most of our respondents were students. So they said, we were feeling less secure in our campus, in our school life. We were discriminated against uh, in our uh, university life. Um, but during the pandemic, because of the lockdown, they weren't exposed to this, so they felt um, more at peace and they experienced less dysphoria or less discomfort. They said they feel better. So let me uh, refer to their educational background. 14% of the respondents either suspended uh, their school life or they dropped out. 75% remained in the education system, but they had internet connection problems, uh, they had low motivation, and they found the education system not to be efficient enough and their psychological well-being was negatively affected and that had an impact on the quality of education as well. Well, from now on, I will uh, take over. Yunus talked about housing, but for those people who weren't present in the previous session, I would like to focus or say a couple of words on housing and uh, then we will focus more on uh, recommendations. As I said before, we had participants from 81 provinces. 26% said they had to change cities. A significant number of them moved back in with their parents. Uh, they had to leave uh, their flatmates. Uh, and all dormitories became uh, houses for quarantine, so they couldn't stay in the dormitories. They had to go back and live with their families. The LGBTI plus people 
are exposed to a phobia by their families. That's why they always focus on living elsewhere and working elsewhere. So going back to their hometowns had a negative impact on many of them. Uh, what kind of other changes were there? Well, people said uh, they were negatively affected by their sisters or brothers, by their families. Uh, they said that they felt isolated or lonely. So um, there was a question about solidarity practices. I wish I could respond to this question from a housing perspective because I worked as a voluntary consultant at the Young LGBTI Plus Association and housing was one of the main problems. Unfortunately, we never had the resources to help people in terms of housing. We tried to find individual solutions through the groups that we were member of members of before the pandemic. But during the pandemic, housing became even more problematic because people were forced to go back and live with their parents. Economic situation, well, most of the participants, as Yunus said, uh, were not employed, so they weren't negatively affected during the pandemic. Our participants are young, most of them were university students, and they weren't in the job market, most of them. But uh, half of the respondents were uh, not students. And because of the fact that uh, they're LGBTI+, plus, uh, they can't find a job or they can't work with an open identity. And then there were stage or performance artists, sex workers, and seasonal workers uh, who were LGBTI plus and who couldn't work because of the pandemic. Especially sex workers are important here because they were afraid to work because of the pandemic measures. Uh, stage and performance artists uh, couldn't work because of the lockdowns. Uh, stage or performance art and sex work are alternative means of work for LGBTI people. So this had a negative impact on the economic uh, means of LGBTI people. I think I already talked about this. It is very clear what they experience economically. Let me say a couple of words on our own solidarity praxis. With the Izmir municipality, we have been working together and especially in three neighborhoods where there were trans sex workers, we started distributing grocery packages. And I can confidently say that we've reached 320 individuals. There's a question whether they have access services. How much they have applied to the uh, NGOs and the municipalities? 42% of them applied over the e-state application. There is not a very intensive level of application. 50 or 55 individuals only applied for state aid. Half of them applied over the uh, electronic applications, but we need to underline this fact. Only one of them received a positive response, 15 received negative response, and remainder received no response at all. Social ramifications, let me talk about this a little bit, because as it was stated previously, LGBT plus people have challenges in the relations they have established with their families. So they have socialization needs more than anything. In our policies, this is what appears to be the situation. And as the associations, we are trying to organize certain activities in order to feed their needs for socialization, either to have a party every week, either to have a drinks party, either to have other activities where these people could get together. But because of the lockdowns, LGBT plus forced LGBT uh, members to 
to be cut off from all the activities that you can imagine. But I would like to talk to you about what we have done alternatively. We try to hold online meetings as much as possible. We have a young base, that's why it was not very challenging for us. We wanted to control our own health, our mental health, and then we decided to get together with our members. We organized parties, which were quite nice. And then we decided to talk about a series of inspiring stories. The LGBT plus members would be able to talk about their stories, which could be inspired in a written form. I would like to accentuate the fact that this is a really important aspect in order to allow the LGBT plus uh, members of the society to articulate themselves, to talk about themselves. This is the violence graph. A vast majority, 30% of the participants stated that they were subjected to violence, mainly domestic violence. I'm not going to dwell upon the details of this, but I would like to come to the recommendations and demands section. You'd, maybe you can take over the floor. We are not going to have much time left to discuss these issues, but let me talk to you about the general landscape. As we can see, LGBT plus members are quite young. They have been to their family homes In big cities, the LGBT plus members can have easier access to opportunities where they can talk about themselves, where they can get help and assistance. But when they go back to their small cities, violence is increased and they lose all their social support mechanisms. They lose their jobs and they uh, lose their access to certain financial means. If you're not living in big cities, if you don't have access to uh, financial resources, if you go back to small cities, you are subjected to a patriarchal family order where you lose out on all your rights and you are victimized tremendously. I think this is where we can finish and this is where we can wrap up. There are so many things we can say, but this is where I want to stop my presentation. Okay, that was great. Without Moving on to the third speaker, I would like to say something. Yunus said the same thing. said the same thing. Applying to social services and not getting an answer. This is so dramatic. It overlaps with everything we have discussed. <clears throat> the existing social assistance network doesn't allow the young people between the ages of 18 to 35 to receive any aid whatsoever. They are denying them. So the social aid system is not comprehensive in Turkey at all. So this is the big challenge that we are facing that I wanted to underline. The state, when it says that they are going to provide social assistance, people apply to the presidential websites, but the 1,000 lira that was launched failed to encompass these uh, people that we have been talking about since the morning. The 1,000 Turkish lira assistance provided by the state covered the rent payments of the individuals owning workplaces already. So there is a great isolation. Those who needed this help, this assistance most, failed to have access to this assistance because this money was only provided to the business owners and nobody else. I don't want to uh, take more of your time than necessary, but instead, I would like to turn the floor over to our third speaker. They are coming from Austria. We would like to thank them for their participation and for not leaving us alone this afternoon. They came to forge a closer cooperation with us. We have Caroline Schmidt from Klagenfurt University working on social inclusion and immigration.
she was previously inv uh, involved in the Mays University. We are talking about immigration, inclusion, solidarity, and uh, asylum seekers. She is heavily involved in uh, social assistance. And recently, she has been focusing on the uh, isolation of young asylum seekers. And she is focusing on social uh, services after natural disasters. Our second speaker is Mark Hill, coming from Innsbruck University from Austria. And Mark Hill is focusing on post-migration -mi uh, studies and education as well. Quite recently, she has, he has been focusing on post-migration societies solidarity. So it is clear as to why we have them to forge a closer solidarity with us. We would like to welcome them once again. Mark Hill is a member of the Center for Globalization and Immigration in Innsbruck University. He is producing training materials for immigration and post-pandemic uh, world. They have a workbook, Face of Migration is the name of this workbook. Caroline Schmidt and Mark Hill will talk about solidarity on the move urban perspectives. You have the floor. We are listening to you impatiently. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and for the kind in invitation here to speak to, to, to you today. It's wonderful here, I think. And um, yes, our title is here Solidarity in Motion Urban Perspectives. And um, you said we are both from the beautiful country, <laughs> Austria, and thank you for the good translation here. Um, we are working on the concept of solidarity um, two years ago, I think, um, and uh, we started before the uh, pandemic. And um, now our lecture is based on uh, two works of us. Uh, it's a, a magazine, a special issue, which is called uh, Solidarity and the book uh, Solidarity on the Move, New Perspectives on, on uh, the Field of uh, Social Work. So um, the solidarity, I think, uh, and we think is uh, close linked to the concept of care yesterday and today also. It's often mentioned in the same sentences, uh, solidarity and uh, care and um, so we can say um, that we want to start with our lecture here now and we start um, with a focus metaphor. Um, I think here I have to, yes, thank you. Uh, with the focus metaphor, a uh, fairy wheel, I will explain it now. Then we come to specific alliances of solidarity action. Then we discuss practices of solidarity and second and last we find some conclusion. In our lecture, we want to ask um, uh, to join us on a metaphorical ride uh, on the Ferris wheel. Uh, a view from above uh, widens and changes uh, perspective and we get uh, completely new ideas. The Ferris wheel is also illustrates uh, something uh, mechanically and it's always uh, in motion. It symbolizes, on the one hand, the mechanical character of solidarity as described by the sociologist uh, um, uh, Emil Durkheim. Um, and on the other hand, people uh, almost uh, automatically feel um, connected due to a similar social situation. Uh, or concern and they stand up for it together like in the pandemic situation. On the other hand, a Ferris wheel uh, also lives from the many different uh, people who visit it quite independently of each other. So we are many different people that would be the organic component of the solidarity concept. Um, everyone brings in their own ideas and uh, own stories. 
uh, solidarity, we can say, is a way to interfere uh, in the social conditions of this world. Our theoretical and practices thinking uh, is close to the following vision here on the slide. The vision of a global and inclusive idea of solidarity overcomes construction of differences and connects living beings around uh, the whole world with each other. And um, the alliance with regard um, to uh, refugee flight uh, to Europe since uh, the year 2015, Mark Terkesides, a psychologist and racism researcher from Germany based um, in Berlin, notes uh, in his uh, famous book, After Migrating New Ideas for the Migration Society, in German, it's uh, Nach der Flucht, Neue Ideen für die Einwanderungsgesellschaft. Um, the, this is a quote, uh, the 2000 refugee crisis has made it clear to even the last that immigration is no longer a marginal issue. So that's very famous that everyone understands that's uh, normal, that migration is normal. Uh, and this is um, this fundamental insight, which is certainly not new, but it's gaining traction. He's uh, interpreted by uh, Taxidis as a post moment of recognition. Suddenly it's clear to everyone that we are living in a fluid society of coming, going, staying on. The after signals a post-migration perspective on things which suggest migration is normality, it moves, it shapes and educates. We live in a mobile society and migration is constitutive uh, as a factor in all social spheres. What IYY has termed human flow. In other words, we need a new understanding of citizenship. And um, here we are uh, pioneering impulses for uh, solidarity are in the eyes of the political scientist Gudrun Henkes initiatives that tireless campaign against the criminalization of sea rescue and that are active on the Mediterranean Sea as well as in local communities and cities. Henkes views actors in civil societies as pioneers in the containment of social inequalities. Over and behind, she interprets urban space as a place of solidarity in which much is experimented with, tried out and learned. For example, a trailblazing project of solidarity are the city ID cards for everyone. Every person is given one no matter what their origin and resident status. There's uh, also a network of uh, solidarity city and um, they have a program and they say all people who live in a city should have a right to basic services, shall be granted access to city infrastructure, shall be provided with education and training, should have access to medical advice and care shall have the right to participate in political decision making, shall have the right to cultural participation, shall have the right to stay. I would like uh, to comment uh, the slides a bit. Um, city ID cards are not completely new phenomenon. It's a concept which is established in different cities in the US and Canada and now gains influence in Europe as well. Uh, let's give an example. In New York uh, City, people have developed uh, the New um, York City ID card. This is a free official identification card for all residents in um, New York City, no matter what your resident status is. The card signals uh, belonging creates a secure status in the cityscape and promotes self-organization. These uh, cards function as a proof of one's identity. They are accepted in libraries, uh, museums, or when you want to rent a flat. 
the card uh, should make it possible for everyone to open a bank account or to show identification when uh, checked by authorities. They certify an urban membership and can be viewed as a public good. The New York City ID card um, is a, a rule model for cities in Europe as well, for example, in Zurich. Zurich is the largest city in Switzerland uh, and is in progress to establish the, so, the so-called Zurich card um, since October 2018. The, the basic idea of it, of the city card, is to express what Richard Zennett um, calls a cité awareness. Cité awareness means um, a solidarity agreement uh, amongst neighbors uh, to live together in a city neighborhood. So uh, we change, we switch now. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And yeah. thank you also from my side uh, to have the opportunity to be here. It's really a pleasure to come into an exchange with you. And while Mark has pointed out to um, city ID cards now, we will uh, now look um, on the local level to see also what uh, you mentioned, like this Cité awareness um, gets promoted in um, specific practices of solidarity. Um, the examples we brought now are from Austria, from the Alpine Adria region. We can discuss that also maybe uh, in comparison to Turkey. Um, and these examples show how people make a connection um, between each other and how people with different biographies and experiences care for each other in a world risk society and how they create what we could also call like a social connection, social cohesion. In the words of um, Nikki Kubacek and Monika Morgre, um, this quote we like quite a lot, um, these authors say, people create a place for those arriving and a shelter for those seeking refuge. Infrastructures of freedom of movement, mobile commons, neighborly environments among non-equals that result from constant arrivals. We see two, two photographs here taken during the so-called weekends for Moria in the city of Klagenfurt in Austria, which is uh, the capital of, the, um, of Carinthia in the south of Austria. And um, Moria here functions as a symbol for all refugee camps worldwide. And uh, these weekends for Moria are regular activities of um, people that come together to go against the separation and segregation of um, refugees in camps. And what um, these people do is that they create an awareness in the urban space through different creative practices the picture you see here on the um, right shows a rapper called Mighty M, also known as Himmeldach. That's his um, artist's name. And the picture was taken in May 2021. And for Mighty M, his music is an important way to, uh, yeah, to, to attract people and to, talk, uh, to draw attention to um, grievances in the world. And he also wrote his own rap, um, rap lyrics for these weekends for Moria. And by doing so, he wants to reach a public, he told us. He wants to reach a public in the city. And looking back, he described in, uh, in an interview one of the events as follows. This is a quote now. There was so much going on as nowhere else because there was a show and then people tend to stand still and to watch and to listen. At the break dancing, and then they see the signs of the campaign and the tents in the back. Another actor of the weekends for Moria is a parkour artist. Um, his name is Peter. And Peter emphasizes that urban culture such as hip hop um, functions as a, as a key, as a, yeah, as something that brings people together. 
And uh, this is also a quote. We wanted to show some material here, some empirical material, um, because we thought it really brings it on the point what we are discussing here. So Peter told us, because hip hop creates possibilities to create contact between different people through a common topic, when you do parkour, when you are a breaker, it doesn't matter what your background is. The focus is on the common thing about which you communicate with each other. So when we take these examples together, we see that um, actions such as rap or parkour in the city space are based on an inclusive idea of living together in the world. And through these creative um, practices, through the, these creative forms of hip hop, these activists open up new narratives of solidarity and bring them to the public with their specific actions and shows. And actors like the rapper Mighty M, who come together at the weekends for Moria, rethink societal hierarchies, we can say, and they try to build down um, exclusion and separation. They design new infrastructures for the young and the next generations and come together as a collective. We heard that quite a lot during these last two days, um, how important it is, it is. And they create a collective agency by bonding and bringing all their engagement together. Um, what is very interesting and what we've seen also in the quote, in the quotes is that they focus on, on unifying and shared life context. So they don't go and talk about separation and segregation. They're focusing on our shared life context of people in a diverse and transnational, transnationalized society characterized by pluralization and social inequalities. And when they arrange their performances, an urban idea of belonging gets visible which aims to break down homogeneous group thinking and homogeneous group constructions. Um, and what they told us was that, yeah, people's origin is not important. It's the common cause, the common things like a rap or a break that people are doing. Yeah, we come to our conclusion now. Um, we wanted to give insight into uh, forms of solidarity in different urban spaces from the city ID cards to um, creative practices of solidarity in the Alpen Atria region. And we think that these examples are of great relevance for the society as a whole and also for uh, us uh, in social work practice, mm, because what they do is that they raise awareness and, and create um, a political awareness and also that we actually live on the same planet and share a responsibility it's only due to that fact. And um, yeah, this idea we, we have discussed uh, already a lot yesterday also, and I think it's what we've heard from the um, authors of the CARE Manifesto as well. Um, in our view, it is important now to make um, solidary alliances, which may not seem as a very typical topic for social work. We would see it differently. The idea is to make these um, alliances visible because they think in a very opening way beyond the separation and segregation of people in camps. And um, yeah, they want to reach what yesterday we noted that it was uh, very precisely what uh, Perry and Uluk uh, has called resilient neighborhoods. So that is what exactly um, they also want to achieve. Um, and in the contrast to um, in the, as in contrast to the large refugee um, accommodation and camps, um, these activities um, develop real utopias and try to really live it um, yeah, in the city. And um, also we see that uh, these examples show how care can be imagined in a transnationalized world. It's now that in Austria and Germany, um, Social work is very much embedded in the welfare state and it's also framed quite nationally. Um, so in these contexts, it might even be more important to have a look at trans, um, transnational alliances to open up the own perspective. Yeah, and in times of global crisis, like the Corona pandemic, but we also talked about that, that it's like we have interacting crisis also with the climate crisis, war and displacement. 
we are in need of yeah, an awareness for what's actually already happened, like these unifying solidarities that do not stop at a certain origin or the borders of a single nation state. Um, at the end of our lecture, we want to come back to the Ferris wheel, um, which was the starting point, like this metaphor from the beginning. And the Ferris wheel stands for perceiving like the solidarities from a bird's eye view from above and in all their diversity. And at the same, same time, we can read this metaphor of the Ferris wheel also as an encouragement um, to all of us to keep moving on in social work and um, to keep working against inequalities and to stand up for inclusion. Yeah, thank you very much. Evet, Karolin ve Mark, Mark'a da çok çok teşekkür ederim. Niye böyle oldu? <gülüyor> <gülüyor> Sesim kulağıma geliyor. Çok heyecanlandım. I heard myself all of a sudden. Just this, I mean this is the last session before uh, the assessment that we are going to have and that is why I forgot to remove my uh, headset. This was a very exciting presentation for me because uh, panels three and uh, panels four and five today focused on solidarity, solidarity or the lack of it. Uh, and we worked on other alternatives to solidarity and solidarity uh, although its objectives may be different can sometimes uh, include exchange of help during times of crises such as the pandemic as explained by um, Pnar in the morning and Hajar in this panel and uh, Caroline and Mark focused on how to make this international uh, and uh, that I found very exciting. In the morning, of course, we uh, heard from Yunus uh, on behalf of SPOD and then uh, in this session we heard from the Young LGBTI Association and then from Caroline and Mark. Um, Solidarity also aims at strengthening support mechanisms, especially for the disadvantaged or uh, more vulnerable groups. In this conference, we focus, we decided to focus on care, but we didn't want to divide care into what is done for children, what is done for, for the elderly, etc. We wanted to approach the issue from a broader perspective. And we wanted to focus on providing care to one another uh, or giving care to one another, uh, receiving it as well. So we wanted to approach uh, the issue of care from a broader perspective. And this last session uh, convinced me that this was uh, the right idea, especially the last presentation gave me this idea respecting uh, diversity and making it widespread are important, said Caroline. And I think these are very good words to conclude the session. They, they spared some time, so I made use of that time and used it on their behalf. So I don't see any questions on YouTube. Are there any questions in the room? Denis. Thank you. We have one more session, by the way. This is not the last session. No, but this is the last panel session. Oh, I don't want people to misunderstand it. We have one more session to go. But yes, but that is uh, for the assessments. It's not a panel. It's not a panel. <laughs> 
So my question is for Caroline and Mark. As they were concluding their presentation, they referred to solidarity practices and they said it's important also for social work from the perspective of social work. Can you pl please elaborate on that sentence? Yeah, thank you, Dennis, for your question. Um, wait, I just have to turn on my turn off my translator, otherwise I hear myself double. Um, yeah, I think um, it's just important uh, to also to say maybe that this is not a, a completely new idea. Many ideas we are discussing here have a broad history also in uh, our discipline and profession. Since social work is so closely uh, connected to social movements already in the past, like connected to the women's movement, for example, or the, the goals are the same, like... Uh, yeah, maybe we, there are different activities going on to reach that goals, some forms of protests, um, other forms uh, work with professional, pro uh, professionalized, um, institutionalized form of um, social work. So I think the connection is clearly there. Um, and um, I, in, in my view, is, um, or in our view, I don't know if you want to add something, Mark, um, it's that the interesting thing is that we have young people here, for example, on these um, weekends for Moria, who, um, who really create a political awareness, which is important in social work when we understand social work as a human rights um, based profession and discipline. And uh, this politicalized understanding of social work is very common when we look at the international definitions of social work, like um, how it's written in the papers of the International Federation of Social Workers. Um, but um, when we go to different national contexts, it's yeah, it's it's important just to to remember that idea. Um, when you work as a social worker in a, ref, a refugee accommodation, for example, and you are confronted. Um, um, with people who are deported, it's important to know about your your professional ethics and your pro what your profession really means to defend what also what you're not doing and where you're not willing to participate. And I, I think that is something um, these activities can really remind us on to, to do that. And also, I think they are important allies when we are thinking what, what you said, yeah, Aisha, I think when we go in the direction of um, uh, internationalized uh, forms of social work, um, that can also mean that professional social workers can uh, go together and work with artists, like maybe uh, bringing these people together or telling young people, hey, we, we know certain networks that could be interesting for you um, to break down these kind of, of separation. I don't know, um, Naisha, that was, I guess, a little bit what you also already said. Yeah. I only can add that um, I think the, the value of these kinds, like concrete things like the urban citizenship card is um, that it's possible to share infrastructures, uh, that uh, it's uh, very important um, to have this kind of cards. And it's um, difficult uh, to, to practice it because there are laws and every um, country are different and so on. But it's um, uh, the right way, I think. And um, so um, the Zurich uh, is a good example that it's now it's coming into Europe too. And uh, we must have a try and we have some research about it now. Yes, mine is not a question, but a comment. Uh, and in addition to what uh, young LGBTI plus said and what Caroline and Mark also said in their presentations. Um, during the pandemic, we 
discovered that cultural activities, be it a concert or any other activity, uh, something that is organized, I mean, individual uh, artistic events in, uh, in a building, for example, brought people together. These people uh, normally did not greet one another maybe but thanks to these activities they saw one another and maybe they care for they cared for one another so maybe cultural activities uh, civil society cultural activities or social movement cultural activities will be important for uh, future solidarity or future care uh, as the young LGBTI plus, would you like to say a couple of more words on your solidarity practices? How did you bring together the members of your community? Thank you for the question. Uh, there were a lot that we uh, didn't have time to discuss, actually. I don't know social work that well, but in civil society, cultural activities and artistic activities gained a, a significant position. I'm not saying this as a negative thing. I'm not saying they've become too popular as a negative thing. Uh, but people come together physically in spite of the pandemic maybe they're still worried, but there's an ongoing need because it is an inseparable part of our being. Direct contact, direct relationship, and maybe those methods that you refer to can be useful in this regard, but um, during the pandemic, I think we ended up with a significant amount of digital fatigue because we were constantly looking at screens. And once we concluded our survey, uh, we weren't quite sure uh, as on, on how we should come together in different committees, etc. And we used these tools, you know, we first shared some information and then we organized some digital activities. So we first checked the level of interaction. We checked whether people were still interested in using these tools or motivated to use these tools. And I can give you the following example. Uh, one of the activities um, that was most preferred was a party. It was just for fun, a digital party, but the, even the digital version was not sustained for a very long time. So I'm still not quite sure about the digital version of these cultural activities, but other than that, yes, I agree with you because such cultural activities uh, create uh, areas for contact that we didn't have in the past. And during the pandemic, we tried to organize digital reunions to come together. Um, but other than that, uh, Due to the factors that I listed, I cannot say that uh, this brings about social support digitally 100%. But I think it had to do with the with the spirit of the time because we focused on each on ourselves more than anything else. I don't know if you would like to add anything. Well, yes. First of all, uh, digitalization and online activities helped us a lot in the sense that uh, our association is based in Izmir, but more than half of our volunteers now come from other cities. So that, uh, this development gave us that opportunity. But at the same time, we had losses in Izmir. Let me give you an example. The online parties uh, create a security problem because uh, you know, we don't know who, with whom the links will be shared for the party. The, the, the, and how are we going to resolve the problem of only allowing people who are 18 plus to consume alcohol? I mean, people will be at home, but how are we going to solve this problem? Because it's an online party after all. Uh, so there are pros and cons. We can't be sure. I wish we could have both. 
I now that I have the floor, I can say a couple of words on housing. Uh, Yunus talked about this, but very briefly. And personally, I believe this is very important. And I believe we can do something on this. You know, we have women's shelters and other shelters for disadvantaged groups. Uh, the shelters uh, for people who've been uh, subjected to violence or who don't have the economic means. We don't refer LGBTI people to these shelters right away because um, either they have to mask their identity or they're asked to feel, to, to act as if they belong to a different gender or sometimes they feel more comfortable uh, acting as if they belong to a gender that they don't feel like belonging to. So there is a, such a need actually, uh, because we were talking about a community uh, where members are subjected to violence mostly by their families. So there is need for some form of a shelter for the LGBTI community as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes, one more. Why don't we take all the questions first? Uh, we have only five minutes left, so let's take all the questions. I'll just share with you a good example and ask my question uh, starting with that. During the pandemic, I was a part of the Tatavla Solidarity Foundation. I was also a VEFA volunteer as well. It was a strategic decision for me to volunteer at the VEFA Foundation. Um, I'm try I'll try to explain how this is relevant from the perspective of social work. Um, when social workers joined the process, solidarity networks became stronger and more inclusive. Uh, there are a lot of LGBTI plus people living in my neighborhood. Uh, there was support available to them uh, from the municipality, from Shishna municipality. Actually, there was support available, but they didn't have any access. And then there were people who had a different diet, such as a vegan diet, or a gluten-free uh, diet. Uh, this is very common, especially among the LGBTI uh, plus community. And um, we received a lot of demands from them about their specific diet. And we had a garden, actually. We had a, a vegetable garden at Piale Pasha. We use that garden to provide food to the LGBTI community. And um, that helps us a lot. Duygu and Shimshek, uh, to what extent do you think the existing support mechanisms uh, were inclusive? And the next question is for everyone. Where were the homeless? Why are they left out of this care um, cycle? Maybe Hajar would like to respond to this question. And what other groups are there that are not visible at the local level and that are left out of the care cycle? What kind of support can be developed through international networks? Thank you. Okay, so we have only two minutes left because this question lasted three minutes. Microphone, please. Microphone, please. We don't hear uh, this comment because she's not speaking into the microphone. You don't have to g give up on your question. We can break a couple of minutes later. My question is not specific to this comment, so I can ask this question in the next session as well. That's why. Okay. All right, then, Hajar. And Duygu. Let's start with Hajar. Okay, where were the homeless? Their situation was even worse. 
I mean, local governments were not ready for anything during the pandemic, and they're not ready for this economic crisis either. Uh, but in certain parts of Istanbul, both the governor's office and the municipality have shelters and there are dormitories there. But to be honest, they're not necessarily sanitary. And when the winter is over or when the pandemic is over, they just shut down the shelters and send people out again. This is not the right thing to do and it's not sustainable. But my observation generally is as follows those people without any social security living in small huts or shanty towns for example uh, they're constantly under the threat of being left without a home because uh, the a landlord is constantly there threatening to evacuate them to evict them um, and where are they going to go anyways so there's a lot of conflict going on there. They live in very crowded houses because they have one or two rooms. And what Dugu said about shelters is very important. But imagine a single woman, let's say her hut was uh, demolished. She has nowhere to go. This happened to me uh, once uh, in the middle of the night. And I called the municipality and many other people trying to find her a shelter. And then they told me that they don't allow women or children. The children couldn't sleep all night because these shelters are not suitable for children, unfortunately. Well, um, a couple of words on shelters. Most of the demands we receive come from Izmir. And since the pandemic is still ongoing, these services are not always accessible to everyone. Someone can be homeless. I mean, someone is homeless, but still they have to have a HES code which is your COVID situation code in Turkey, developed by the Ministry of Health, that you should have to have access to certain institutions. I mean, I see the point, but then it's impossible for them to have such codes. I mean, um, some of the um, social workers or other support people at the centers say, well, you can refer people here, but we can't always accept them here because they don't have a HES code. And these people became even less visible uh, during the pandemic. And about the solidarity networks, as I said before, sex workers and trans sex workers, they work in the gray market, of course, they're not registered workers. So uh, the first thing we did for them was to get our hands on anything we could find, for example, food items. So we tried to provide them with rations, you know. Uh, there's a, there, there are a lot of sex workers in uh, the neighborhood where the association is. So we tried to provide them with them direct support, but people who lived close to one another helped one another. It was like a massive uh, joint help effort, but at a close distance, you know, not from far away within the city. And there was no specific support for LGBTI plus. Well, uh, the implementation of the Istanbul Convention, and the fact that discrimination against LGBTI community, once they're discussed, I think we will be able to prevent these. Yes, I see no other questions. I would like to thank all our speakers for their presentations. We won't take a break. We will move on to our review session right away. Uğur Tekin will, Tekin will be our moderator and both speakers will be on Zoom. So let's have Ur here.
uh, the microphone is off or uh, we can't hear him on, on Zoom. I'm not sure which, but I don't hear the moderator, so I can't interpret. Döneminin e, getirdiği e, ortamın sonucu olarak böyle bir tartışma ya da açmak istemiş bu konferansa. Öncelikle So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here for the final panel of this conference, Rethinking Social Work. Um, I'm really sorry that I could not attend more, more sessions. It's a very busy time here in London with the end of term and also the uh, university and college union is going on strike. So it's pretty crazy at the moment. But what I would like to do is for my few minutes is I, I would like to say a few words about the CARE Manifesto and the CARE Collective um, who wrote the CARE Manifesto and what we were trying to do uh, when we wrote it. Um, so as you might know or might not know, the CARE Manifesto was written collaboratively by five people by the CARE Collective um, and the CARE Collective itself began as a reading group made up of five academics from different from different disciplines in 2017. And all of us are also activists in various social justice movements. Um, and really the manifesto began as a kind of intellectual exercise. We, we, we, we met and we discussed various um, texts and, and, and issues and developments in the UK. And we asked ourselves, what would the world look like if the organizing principle of society were care rather than neoliberal carelessness. And so in an effort to conjure up a world organized around care, we decided to look at different scales um, from the planetary through econ economies to the state, um, to communities and our intimate kinship structures. So, Part of our motivation for writing the manifesto, as I think I noted yesterday uh, in, in the first talk, was that we, we as a collective felt that we had gotten too used to dystopian visions of the future and that we really needed a different narrative, a collaborative utopian counter narrative for the 21st century. And in a sense, we were following on from Naomi Klein's insight that no is not enough. Um, and I should also probably say um, that our manifesto is meant to be a provocation. Um, and as this conference attests to, the question of care, and particularly in the wake of COVID-19, care has emerged as a central and urgent concern to and for activists and scholars. Um, and so in the Care Collective, we provocatively posit that in contrast to calls for liberation in the 60s and 70s, care has become the key problematic for politics today. And so our goal really was to contribute to the ongoing conversations around care from the long tradition of Native American activism to the feminist ethics of care and the work by groups like the Women's Budget Group in the UK and so many others. So we're really drawing on all of this work. Um, and another important thing I think to note is that we actually began writing the CARE Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence in 2019. And this is of course before COVID broke and we could not have anticipated how grimly urgent COVID would then make our manifesto. So in the manifesto, we echo and draw on scholars like Nancy Fraser, and the Native American scholar Nick Estes. And we posit that the current global crisis, and not just COVID, but rising inequality everywhere, endless war, the refugee crisis, and of course, imminent environmental catastrophe is primarily a crisis of care. 
Um, it's the result of histories of colonial, imperialist, misogynist, and white supremacist, supremacist violence, compounded now by decades of intensified neoliberal policies and the reduction of ever more domains of our lives to a market logic. And a, you know, in the UK and elsewhere, we've now witnessed years of austerity measures. We've witnessed years of intensified deregulation and privatization. And this has gone side by side with the devaluing of care practices and care work. And in the manifesto drawing again on uh, <laughs> histories of scholarship, um, we claim that this devaluing of care practices and care work is in large part due to care's historical association with and to women and the domestic sphere. And what all of this has meant is that too many countries did not have the necessary infrastructure or even the political will to deal effectively with COVID-19. And so part of coming to terms with COVID-19 in the manifesto and addressing COVID-19, which we did as we were finishing the manifesto, what we claim is that on the one hand, COVID has dramatically and horrifically exposed what we call the reigning politics of carelessness. But at the same time, and on the other hand, the, pa the pandemic has also dramatically exposed our profound interdependence, interdependence and interdependencies. It has highlighted in all kinds of ways our shared vulnerability and that the need for care is part and parcel of the human condition. And so there are a few key premises that undergird the manifesto's vision um, and its vision of a politics of care. And what first and foremost um, is that building a caring world begins by recognizing and avowing that our survival and our thriving are always everywhere, are everywhere and always contingent on others. So creating caring alternatives involves, again, first and foremost, avowing our mutual interdependencies, as well as addressing the inevitable ambivalences that care and caregiving often generate. So it's only once we acknowledge the challenges of our shared dependence as human beings, as well as our vulnerability, our irreducible differences, and our many ambivalences around care, can we fully value the resources necessary to promote the capacities and the capabilities of everyone. So a caring politics is one that recognizes the intricacies and the ambivalences of human interactions. And we, we also posit that such a politics, a politics of care that recognizes the ambivalences of human interactions is also better poised to enhance democratic processes on all levels of society. I mean, if you think about it, working with and through ambivalence and contradictory emotions and claims are key to building sustainable democratic communities. Another key premise is that only by ensuring that communities have ample resources, infrastructure, but also time, can we create the conditions that render a caring disposition toward the other, however distant, ever more possible. We know that caring time and neoliberal time are very different. The first is slow, focused, attentive, and often repetitive. The second is accelerated and extensive. So how exactly do we understand care in the manifesto? So the manifesto's understanding of care is, is informed by Joan Tronto's distinction between caring for, which includes the physical aspects of hands-on care, caring about, which describes our emotional investment in and attachment to others, and caring with, which describes how we mobilize together politically in order to transform our world. So the CARE Manifesto draws on these insights, but we also believe it pushes them further by asking after the conditions of possibility that would make caring for, about, and with ever more possible. So drawing on feminist political theory, care ethics, but also on non-Western notions of kinship, where non-human life and the earth are and the earth itself are considered kin, we begin the manifesto by diagnosing the interconnected nature of what we again call the current reign of carelessness. 
and we use scale. So using scales, we begin from the global dimension, discussing the climate crisis and economies that put profit over people and the planet, traveling down or scaling down, as it were, through to careless states, careless communities, to how what we call the banality of carelessness affects our interpersonal intimacies. But then we travel outward, scaling up from the interpersonal to the planetary in order to outline caring alternatives to our contemporary condition of carelessness. And we decided to use the scalar structure because we wanted to really underscore how our capacities to care are interdependent and can only be cultivated and realized by avowing the inextricable interconnection among these scales. Now, I'm gonna outline in very broad strokes some of the caring alternatives that we offer in our manifesto. Our vision of caring alternatives begins, as I said, as we scale out from the most intimate aspects of our lives, kinship. And what we do in this section is that we argue that we need to reimagine the limits of familial care to embrace what we call more promiscuous models of kinship. And here we're, we, we invoke examples from the Black Panthers alongside feminist and gay liberation, healthcare initiatives of the 1970s. And we draw on the ACT UP activist Douglas Crimp's notion of promiscuous. promiscuous. Uh, Crimp uses promiscuous not in the sense of casual or indifferent, but to describe the exper experimental ways that gay men were intimate with and cared for one another during the AIDS epidemic. These experimental intimacies ultimately served as the basis for the safer sex initiative that went on to save so many lives. So the concept of promiscuous care that we develop in the manifesto recognizes that history, culture, and habit make some forms of care more likely than others, such as parental care. But promiscuous care also recognizes that not all women want to be mothers and not all men want to be fathers, whether they can be or not, and that caring for children who are not your own, caring for the community and caring for the environment are equally valuable tasks that must be adequately resource, resourced and appreciated. Indeed, uh, the neoliberal defunding and undermining of care has led to paranoid and chauvinistic caring imaginaries, namely looking after only our own. And the manifesto insists that with adequate resources, time, and labor, people would, act, would feel secure enough to care for, about, and with strangers. So promiscuous care really means caring more and in ways that remain experimental and extensive by current standards. It means, it means multiplying who we care for and how. Moving to the level of community, the manifesto argues that the only way to cultivate and maintain caring communities is by amplifying spaces that are public, shared, and cooperative. Communities that care stop, stop the hoarding of resources by the few. Instead, caring communities need to and must be able to prioritize the commons. Communities based on care ensure that ensure the creation of collective public spaces as well as objects. They encourage what we call a sharing infrastructure. This means, of course, reversing neoliberalism's compulsion to privatize everything. And so this means cheaper free public transport and public lending facilities, including local libraries of tools and equipment, as well as books. It means ending the costly and damaging outsourcing of care and other basic services by insourcing, by bringing them back into the public sector and into communities. It's only by imagining and creating communities that are adequately resourced, co-produced, and that enable us to connect, to deliberate, and to debate with one another, as well as to support each other's needs, can we confront and work through, again, the complexities and the amb ambivalences created by our mutual dependencies. So as we move from caring kinship to caring communities and caring states, the manifesto also asks, what are the conditions that would enable the expansion rather than the contraction of democratic participation at all levels? And clearly part of the answer lies with reimagining the state. So a caring state, according to the manifesto, is clearly one in which the provision for all of our basic needs and a sharing infrastructure are ensured, while at the same time, participatory democracy is deepened at every level. 
but a state can only be caring if notions of belonging are based on recognition of mutual interdependencies rather than on ethnocultural identity and racialized borders. So creating caring states requires not only recognition of past atrocities, but also a reckoning with forms of reparation for these past atrocities, whether we're talking about genocide, slavery, and or dispossession. So the manifesto, again, drawing on a long history of activism and scholarship argues that it's only by confronting the past, the past and prioritizing the needs of those who have been most marginalized, violated, and negated by uncaring nation states will we be able to move forward into a juster future and cultivate a radically different way of relating to others and to the world itself. This, of course, means turning the current priorities of the state on their head. It also means renewing models of welfare and social provision while refusing the post-war welfare state rigid hierarchies and sexual and ethnic division of labor. And of course, it means refusing all racialized policies. So caring states would clearly need to rebuild and safeguard affordable housing, along with high quality public schooling, university education, vocational training, and healthcare. But that also means that we need to rethink about, we need to rethink education because education and vocational training would have to be transformed since they would emphasize care and caretaking practices and developing the, the capacities and the capabilities of each person to hone their caring skills while insisting that learning is about enhancing old as well as discovering new ways to nurture life and the world. Finally, um, caring states with sustainable economies and porous borders are the best possible route to global care and to transnational conviviality, which we argue is a way of thinking about cultivating a transnational orientation of care toward the stranger. Our caring, imagina our caring imaginaries at the moment need, they need to move beyond the nation state and to the furthest reaches of the strangest parts of the planet, both human and non-human. So ultimately then, and coming full, coming back full circle, it's only by acknowledging and valuing rather than disavowing our global interdependencies that we can create any kind of caring world at all. And so the care manifesto, manifesto calls for inventive forms of collective care at every single scale of life. And I'll just sum up by saying that the way in which we, we, we ultimately understand care is as our individual and common ability to provide the political, the social, the material, and the emotional conditions that allow for the greatest possible number of people and living creatures on the planet, along with the planet itself, to thrive. So the Care Manifesto is clearly a utopian and a grandiose project and vision. But what it does try to do is to provide an alternative or a counter narrative to neoliberalism and the current reign of carelessness. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to give you brief information about the rest of the conference and then to forward over to you, if you would allow me. I think I can, I think I can not hear you, but I will proceed. We have a utopia. We have a very developed model for a society, but then we are focusing on the steps to be taken forward in order to achieve this utopia. And this manifest is setting the boundaries within which we can work on and we can hope to accomplish this utopia. It was a very wide array of deliberations which inspired us and it was very satisfactory in terms of interpreting what further we could do in order to transfer into a public post in a post-pandemic era 
that was capable of creating this utopia. We are talking about moving on to a new life, moving on to a new reality. And this is the perspective we wanted to achieve within this conference. Professionally and personally, we wanted to address this topic from the social services and social works perspective. Let's revisit this, these series of sessions. We had discussions on the care manifesto and we talked about the reproduction burden over the shoulders of women who were confined in their households. We talked about the fact that their efforts were devalued and we discussed how we could revalue the homemakers' efforts in this day and age, in this post-pandemic era. We also talked about possibilities and projects which could render women's labor more visible in the society. And in the next sessions, we shall be talking about the clashes between different groups of the society. This is the moment where we will focus on the methods that were adopted by civil society organizations to address the post-pandemic era. We are trying to reach to a conclusion from a point of view of social workers. We are hoping to create a public model, a good public model for the future. And we are trying to determine which steps we could take forward in order to achieve our targets. We have initiated this discussion because we believe that we can contribute to setting the boundaries for the future. The caretaker and the caregiver, the service provider and the service receiver, the relations established between these stakeholders will yield to a new public order. It's going to be quite important for us to build a new public order. For example, Kadıköy Solidarity Foundation stated that they were actively involved in certain events and in certain internal discussions. Social services are all about fundamental rights and the liberties owned by individuals. And social services should be designed in such a way that they will cater to the fundamental expectations of humans. So social work is a different kind of a profession which be bears in itself a significant level of commitment, of dedication. Social workers should forge close relations with the people that they're interacting. The experiences we cultivate from our ordinary daily lives can easily be translated into the way we convey social work and social services. So we need to use the social dynamics while we are trying to provide assistance to those in need. Social solidarity networks that used to exist even before the pandemic became more important, more significant during the pandemic because they have extended a helping hand to those in need who couldn't get out of our houses, who couldn't have access to finances. So this is the day and age where we need to revisit these concepts. The institutionalized structures should 
gönüllük temelinde alttan yukarı support us on a voluntary basis to provide sustainable support to the mere members of the society who are in constant need. And this is a prolonged process, which we need not to forget. Still, there are certain problems that we need to talk about. Social work is a profession. Social work is a profession. And social work should be supported with personal will and personal dedication, as I've said before. Such discussions will pay the way to a brighter future as an association, I believe, because the solidarity cords formed here will be adopted by the entire public and will be sustained by the entire public. We hope and pray that we will be able to avoid the hierarchical structure inside humanitarian aid organizations, because such hierarchical organizations or hierarchical formations inside humanitarian aid structures will pave the way to their deterioration. We should not consider humanitarian aid as a means of political presence. This has always been the case, and that will always be the case, but we have to find a way to detach ourselves from our political aspirations and focus on solidarity networks, which could be sustainable, which could be brought into the future to support the human race as a whole. Beyond all of our deliberations for a better public, what kind of steps we need to take forward? That's the debate. Are we going correctly or are we making mistakes? Are we just focusing on the activity of helping and receiving help? Or are we talking about a sustainable structure which will support all those in need in the society? Because those in need in the society will remain where they are so long as they're not giving the access to professional progress or personal development. Such approaches will help us with our theoretical discussions and debates during this conference. And this is where I would like to conclude my remarks. I will turn the floor over to Sema. I'm trying to say something about the connections between the topics that we had discussed. And now Sema will take the floor to further elaborate on these issues. Well, thank you so much. I've been following this conference for the last two days. I would like to thank the members of the uh, academia, the students, the associations, and the activists. I have learned a great deal, a great deal of what I have not known before. The uh, activities of the activists have been inspiring. I'm incredibly moved. I'm incredibly inspired. I have the care manifest in my hands and I've been reading it thoroughly. In this day and age, we need these exercises. We need these thoughts. We need these deliberations more than ever. We are going through such a time that every structure we came to know is being shattered to its roots. We are enjoying increased interaction between ourselves thanks to the pandemic. We can connect to one another any minute that we want. But while we were so confident in uh, communicating with one another, we also had time to create a utopia, a utopia which can be based on our deliberations. There are the good and there are the bad in the world. 
When we talk about a good society, we immediately think about the good and the bad. The good needs to organize. And I immediately thought about mobilizing such a movement in Turkey, which could be called as the Association of Goodwill Individuals. I thought if there could be a valid movement or not. So anyway, we have a communication, but we have a problem with language. In Turkey, we have a language barrier. I am a person who is researching in Turkey and who is trying to focus on the research activities all around the world where I encounter a language barrier all the time. I can read long lines out of this book with references to the concept of care. Care and maintenance are the two words that I personally focus on. We have two options which need to be discussed by the linguists all around the world. John Yücel, famous uh, poet in Turkey, once stated that reading Shakespeare in a translated text was challenging. We can opt for the Esperanto language as a second option, regardless of where these uh, materials were produced, regardless of their languages of origins, we can still keep on using these foreign concepts in order to define our recommendations or deliberations. We're using Nescafe, we're using sexist, we're using the word activist. These are not Turkish words, but we seem to find ourselves in a controversy because for example, gender, gender cannot be described in the Turkish language as easy as it would be in English or Anglo-American languages. So we have to make a distinction between the definitions of care and showing care or giving care. I'm not going to extend my time because I believe everybody is quite exhausted. We have been discussing for the last two days and I find myself in a position to be obliged to summarize my remarks. While we are trying to form this new world, while we are trying to help this new understanding to emerge, we have to make a distinction between the experiences of the northern countries and the southern countries. ortaya çıktı. Herkes yaşadığı krizi kendi noktasından görüyor haklı olarak. Everybody seems to interpret this crisis from their own point of view. Quite naturally so. We are not uh, involved in the concept or the uh, context, but we are mostly involved in our individualities. We are trying to answer our questions from individual point of view, but at the same time, we're trying to create a global answer. When I read the Care Manifesto first, I saw the word community, which I translated to Turkish as cemaat, but the Turkish word cemaat means something else to me. They belt. They built co uh, collectives. Uh, I deal with migration and associations, hometown associations, for example. Therefore, uh, what community means to me, the way I translated it to Turkish, is probably different than what my colleagues in the UK think. I shared this with other social workers before. We had a joint project with uh, Sweden. We compared the Swedish family with a Turkish family and we looked at autonomy and dependency. Uh, Turkish women 
want to be autonomous and Swedish women are tired of autonomy because it's tiring for a woman uh, to be autonomous because it brings about many burdens at the same time. Uh, the party in power in Turkey right now, uh, the ruling party has been in power for 20 years now. And I was thinking how I could interpret this. This is like pre-modern uh, social uh, idea. Uh, so this is the state of the ruling party that uh, has the future idea of a pre-modern society. This is a male dominant order, of course. And at the same time, there are rapidly developing NGOs in this very state. So looking at these groups of women, paradoxically, we see the following. The people who vote for this um, party are uh, women working from home or who deal with domestic work. So when I read the manifesto and when they refer to the state, the community, kinship, uh, I think that the relations that I observe are very different from what my British colleagues observe in their uh, environments. So we use the same concepts, but the system that we perceive is different. Um, and that is why I think we have to understand the difference between these systems uh, mutually, first of all. And I, of course, listened to the activist. I found Hajar Fogo's work to be very interesting because she focused on deep poverty. I respect her work, but creativity, in my opinion, has two different uh, aspects. First of all, the government has this pre-modern future idea and there are certain channels of uh, cooperation or help, and then there are other groups that experience deep poverty. There were rising households. I mean, there was this um, project that I ran in uh, poorer neighborhoods, and there, uh, there were rising neighborhoods. They were rising because they had uh, links with people from their hometown who also migrated to the uh, metropolitan areas, for example. And then there were the middle class people who were more isolated. You might remember that four siblings committed suicide together once. It was a couple of years ago in Turkey. Uh, so there is some activist movement supporting the middle class as much as they can. Uh, but I here would like to make a reference to Erhan Doğan. Erhan Doğan works uh, uh, on a completely different issue. But after the uh, suicide of these four siblings, Erhan came up with an idea uh, for middle class families who cannot pay their invoices. So he developed this joint system where people could pay others invoices um, for them. Uh, in other words, we all have to be creative, we all have to have a form of relationship, but maybe we have to think more on the form of this relationship. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay. Let's uh, see if we have any questions from the room. Or any comments. Thank you. Ben e, bakım manifestosu üzerinden e, e, bir şeyler söylemek istiyorum. My comments e, will be on the care manifesto. I made a presentation yesterday in the morning session. And of course, 
Uh, there are certain ideas that come to the forefront here, and uh, Catherine, in her presentation, stated that their starting point was to write a utopia rather than a dystopia. And of course, it's easier to write a dystopia because we already experience some form of evil, and it's easier to imagine the direction that one might go towards. Uh, but there's a structure that I see in uh, this book. Um, actually, I think we convert uh, things into a real utopia. And in the CAR manifesto, there are many examples uh, of 1960s and 70s. Probably they're the most efficient times of human history. How And uh, these examples show us how a different form of care or kinship was possible, is possible. So these are real examples that are uh, listed in the book. So I believe that the utopic character here is a bit different. It's real utopian, I would say. When I was reading the book, I felt like there was a the, the, there is this project that isn't complete. This project was uh, active uh, in Europe in certain geographies, or as mentioned in the text, it's like uh, the cooperatives uh, built in Spain after Franco. They're still alive as alternative structures, or just like the Athens example, you know, there are still those groups providing rations to people and those are still alive. Uh, it's like there was this care project that was active in the 60s and 70s, and it, this is more like a continuation of that project. So it gives me the idea that the care, the, the care manifesto uh, is the continuation of a project that was initiated years ago. And that is why I believe it also has a very realistic emphasis to it. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Hello. I think my comments will be all over the place, and I'm not sure if I'm going to end up with a question or not. But uh, I will just share with you the thoughts that came to my mind after hearing all the panels. Of course, we've been given several practical examples. We heard a lot of observations from the field. We heard a lot about the conceptual framework. So it was a very comprehensive conference from the beginning till the end. And this was possible because uh, the very question of care itself uh, intersects with many different aspects of society. It's in the very heart of society. And um, I'll go back to an earlier concept to better explain this, the reproduction of production relations. It doesn't have to be a production relation, to be honest. It's just like the reproduction of life itself. And I believe uh, care is a social relation that is in the very heart of this. This is what I understood from uh, the discussion uh, that, that I heard uh, these last two days. So um, taking up care as a question on its own uh, brings about the following thoughts. Uh, we start asking questions about the very nature of us being a society um, the care changing form, uh, the family as an institution changing its form. In other words, um, or in simple terms, this goes all the way down to capitalist relations changing their form. Uh, as we heard these last two days, uh, 
there was a lot of reference to welfare states and neoliberal policies and neoliberal societies and that's why there was a lot of emphasis on the family on care and i would like to make a couple of references i think it was the first session of the first day and professor bashak said care is one of the subcategories of social reproduction uh, but it's not limited to that because at the same time care includes certain personal relations frailties uh, emotional work or an emotional dimension so uh, it doesn't fit into being only a subcategory of social production uh, and i agree with this but i don't think that it shows us that it's not a subcategory of social reproduction because in capitalism or in neoliberal capitalism there are economic relations that are generated but there are emotions frailties as well generated by uh, by the system and that's how the system actually reproduces itself so discussing the form of care is actually discussing the form of capitalism that we're in in my opinion and that is why I believe it uh, opens the way or paves the way for radical future thoughts or utopian thoughts, let's say. I will wrap up without further ado. Uh, just one more uh, remark. In the previous session, we heard from Caroline and Mark and they refer to solidarity and its close link with uh, care. And they said it is a form of intervening in the world that we live in. That I found very interesting. I mean, it was an interesting emphasis for me. But the content of that intervention that is about the content of the intervention we don't live in a world that is heterogeneous. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't live in a world uh, where all the shares are equal. So when you intervene in this world, it also becomes, in my opinion, a destructive act. That's all from me. I don't want to take more of your time. These are ju just some of the thoughts that came to my mind listening to all uh, the debates. And uh, we heard uh, people from many different disciplines, and that's uh, why I thought of all these ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't want to take too much of your time either. Just a couple of points. these last two days reminded me that we have to highlight the following there are two problematic institutions here in this discussion one is the family the other one is the state and the main axis of all this debate is care which intersects both i mean you can call this social care social responsibility whatever it is so it's configuring care as a social matter, um, removing it or taking it away from the family institution or state as an institution, detaching it from these institutions. And um, during the pandemic, we saw that certain things 
uh, were resolved by the state or by the family just because we don't have the solidarity network that we should have. We still have the same problem. Social solidarity networks are still weak. This was a crisis for the capitalist state, the pandemic, but it was a crisis for the people who fought against the capitalist state as well. I observed the Turkish example, of course, and uh, young people in Turkey who were living with their, who, who were uh, sharing flats with their, with their flatmates, with their friends, or who were living in dormitories and who were university students had to go back to their families, to live with their families uh, during the pandemic. They had to ask their family for support. And this actually strengthened the function of the family that regenerates oppression. And the solution was still expected from the state. Even we expected the solution from the state. As long as we don't have the other solidarity mechani mechanisms in place, we always uh, look up to the state over and over again. Well, we're trying to build a new order, and when building a new order, of course, you can't disregard the state at all. But I think we have to question the following. Uh, the state that cares for the market cannot uh, tame itself to act against the markets. I don't know what we can expect from such a state. I think this is the type of question that we should ask ourselves. We have to question the capitalist state, but taming it in different colors, will it solve the problem, really? Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. And actually, there are a couple of questions on YouTube as well, and I can read them, maybe. YouTube yayın izleyen Burcu Neon, who's watching our uh, YouTube screen uh, stream, uh, asks the following. Uh, this is a question for Sema. She says, I'm an academician who's now working in the UK. I worked in other countries before, and I agree with Sema, because concepts mean different things in different countries, and these differences are significant. I want to go back and ask a question to Catherine. Uh, but starting with language, as Sema said. For example, Sema said she translated community into Turkish as cemaat. And the word cemaat reminds us of uh, associations that bring together immigrants from the same hometown or uh, kinship, etc. So this uh, word that we use in Turkish makes a reference to relatives, to kinship, to more traditional relations. My question to Carolyn, she said Carolyn, but I think she means Catherine. Um, you use the word community in your book. Um, and when you use that word, you use the concept caregiving community. How do you define community in that concept of caregiving community? So that is my question to Catherine. There is one more quest question on YouTube, and I will read that too. This is again for Catherine. It's in English. So I'll read it in English. No, I'll, I'll translate it to Turkish. How can we imagine a care-centered or care-oriented university? Uh, how do you um, implement the ethical principles that you mention in your book, in your daily life at your university? Thank you. Anyone else who would like to have the floor? 
No one is asking for the floor, so let's give the floor to Catherine first. Well, first, I want to thank you all for the comments and for the questions. Um, and I also have some comments and questions, but I'll leave those for later. So in terms of, um, there were three particular questions that I understood were directed at me. One had a, was around uh, language, which I think is a particularly fascinating question, but it also assumes that language, even in English sort of community or care is, has a particular meaning and that we can sort of, we can circumscribe that meaning. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's in fact true. I think that in terms of gender, for example, as Judith Butler has argued, even in English, it's a word that's been created and is foreign also in English. So I think that there's a matter of translation even within our own languages. And one of the things that I um, would like to say is that actually I spent a great deal of my adult life in the Middle East and in, in Israel. And so my experiences have been both have been in America and the UK and, and also in Israel, Palestine. And so the translation is, is constant in terms of uh, both thinking about words like community and thinking about um, sort of the, the some, I think you use the pre-modern sort of conceptions of kinship in different countries. And I think the, dif the differences are absolutely key. And we're constantly translating these terms and these concepts amongst ourselves and in the care collective, um, I think Joe, Joe and Jamie are the only actual uh, British uh, British people, and, and, and Andreas comes from Greece, and I uh, come from different parts of the world, and also Lynn comes originally from Australia. But that's beyond. In terms of community, you asked whether how we define it, and I think one of the important things to say is that we actually don't really define community. We ask what a caring community would look like with very general outlines with the recognition, and I think we state that at the, at the beginning, is that not no two communities are, are, are alike. And that we, we, but what we would argue is that communities, caring communities, not caregiving communities, caring communities would have a few central uh, features. And those I outlined before, which are around sharing infrastructure, lots of public space, and whether or not we're talking about uh, sort of tr traditional kinship or we're talking about communities coming together in, let's say, a neighborhood in London, the question that I would throw back at you is what the assumption that somehow those would be different in terms of what would, what would be the underlying um, assumptions for what would make it a caring community. Why would they be different if we take promiscuous care as the foundation of how we build these communities. So I think we need to rethink, you know, our, our assumptions about, um, you know, kinship, where it's related by a lot, you know, by, by, by marriage or by biology and, and, and chosen community. And sometimes, as we know, a chosen community um, is much more caring. Um, but I think that the same kinds of underlying principles for how we understand caring communities, we would we would argue perhaps provocatively and polemically would need to be in place. And those are the those are the ones that we outline with full recognition that no two communities are going to be the same. So what we tried to do successfully or unsuccessfully is to provide a, a, a, a sort of a working template where it is it both um, it's both guidelines but not necessarily prescriptive in in the ways that it has to be the same everywhere. So I don't know if that answers the question, but that's how I would uh, that's why I would answer the question about community, that these terms, just like care, which comes again from a long tradition of meaning both uh, sorrow and concern, right, in the English language, that our languages are always um, informed and influenced by interactions with other languages. So, um, and I, and, and that, so the, the question about what, the other question about the university and a caring university, that's actually something that Lynn has been working on um, and looking at the ways in which we we need to transform higher education. I don't know how, I mean, I, I don't know the exact situation in Turkey and the UK things are imploding in the higher education uh, sector um, because of changes to tuition, because of changes, uh, because of the neoliberalization of higher education in, in the UK. And um, we need to rethink it completely. I don't know 
I don't have the answers to what a caring university would look like, but certainly the priorities would have to be turned on their heads where it would have to be education would have to be a good in and of itself and not because, uh, you know, when students are not do not conceive themselves as consumers and where we're critical thought is encouraged rather than de uh, uh, silenced and what we're seeing more and more is critical thinking and uh, is being silenced in the UK um, and discussions uh, are being um, are really not taking place where a kind of critical thinking and care where care is the focus of education is at the center. Um, and what I'm doing in my own life, well, I'm vice president of the <laughs> of the university and college union at, at the University of Nottingham. And one of the ways that I try to um, think with my colleagues, and we, you know, it's a group of wonderfully committed union activists, is we're we're we're struggling against the the kinds of cuts and the kinds of priorities that our management is imposing on us. And so, as you might know, we, um, and at Nottingham in particular, where I am, we've now voted uh, with a very strong mandate to go on strike and to stop the kinds of cuts. Um, and, but that's not enough. I mean, this is just sort of um, incremental. And what needs to happen is we need to rethink the way in which universities are funded. We need to rethink the ways in which vocational training and social work is valued and uh, in society, so that means um, it means be, it means basically rethinking from start to end uh, what we want in terms of university graduates. And I think we're going in the absolutely wrong direction. So um, again, uh, the the the the difference between the conceptualizing um, and I really appreciate Maharam. I think it's I hope I'm not pronouncing your name incorrectly, but probably am. Um, your your thoughts about uh, sort of a realistic utopia, I love that. I think that that's a great um, way of thinking about the Care Manifesto because it's always sort of a goal that we're constantly trying to achieve and always failing on some level, but constantly trying again and again to uh, refocus our energies and our, our resources into making care first and foremost as the organizing principle and way that we operate. Um, so yeah, I'll stop and uh, thank you also Sema for your comments. Um, and. Sema or Jam? Yes, Sema. Would you like to take the floor? This is the very first time I'm making a presentation uh, on Zoom. Uh, I find it very strange watching my face when I'm presenting. It's, it's a huge loss that I can't see your reactions. Uh, the welfare regime in Turkey is based on the family. Uh, somebody raised it a couple of minutes ago that we have two matters in Turkey, the family and the state. And the welfare system in Turkey has the family in its heart. Uh, these may be traditional relations for the UK, but um, the family relations in Turkey, kinship, uh, being biological or not, is changing. I mean, there is a disintegration of these relations. There's a disintegration of the regime, and that's why people are worried, both men and women. And I think that is why, and maybe that is why there is this much resistance against this disintegration. But on the other hand, the civil society is very lively and open to the world. But the civil society consists of modern middle class young people who have links with the West, who follow the Western literature very closely. Um, but I will still suggest that they use all these concepts taking into account the context. Somebody said capital is state. Well, it's doubtful if the state in Turkey is that capitalist. There are different types of capitalism, but the Turkish state may not be called a capitalist state in the Western sense of the term. Our government, our state is a pre-modern states 
So that's another debate. This is something that I just wanted to bring up as a question as well. Ayşe Bura's book on state and businessmen. I'm sure you read it. She says uh, the relationship between businessmen and the state is not a capitalist one. Of course, we have to discuss all these things, but it, we have to be very meticulous when uh, translating concepts. I mean, not only us, but our uh, Western friends as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to have the floor? Can I just ask the question from... Tamam. Buyurun. Ketrin. Ketrin siz şu anda yes, konuşabilir. Yes, please, Catherine. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, Sema, I'm just wondering because in, I don't, I, I'm sure there's a lot of now um, literature, but also talk around, around the ways in which they um, withdraw the welfare state in Anglo-American uh, society, but also I imagine in Europe, has actually reinforced traditional uh, families. And we see this very, very strongly. So I think that the, the notion that somehow in the UK or in the US, the, the places where that I know best, mm -hmm. um, that somehow there has been sort of a, a dissolution of the nuclear family, at least maybe not the extended family, I think needs to be rethought. I mean, wh with the withdrawal of the, of the welfare state, whatever was there to begin with in the US, what we see, like in Melinda Cooper's work, um, the family has actually been the site uh, where of care uh, and the traditional family in many ways. So it's interesting to think about the, the, the, strip, the ways in which these different countries have strengthened the, the heteronormative family a, and maybe you know a convergence convergence of factors where the family has reemerged as sort of the center of um, of care and caregiving uh, when you don't have the same kind of resources that would enable uh, the dissolution. YouTube'da iki tane soru var. Önce peki Sema Hocam cevap vermek ister misiniz? Yok hayır yani katılıyorum. Tamam. O zaman YouTube'daki soruları okuyorum. Hı hı. Birinci soru, pandeminin evsizlere yönelik bilinci ve farkındalığı değiştirdiğini düşünüyor musunuz? Evsizlik alanındaki kamu hizmetleri bu süreçten sonra nasıl yürüyecek sizce? Ee, bir soru bu. İkinci soru, to toplum temelli bakım kavramı, Bakımı aile ve cemaat temelli ilişki biçimlerinden ayrıştırmak için üzerinde daha fazla düşünebileceğimiz bir kavram olabilir. Bir, başak. Evet. Evet. Ee, ben e, cevap vermek isteyen arkadaş yoksa ben cevap vereyim. If you don't want to answer this question, I will be more than happy to answer. Or maybe we can give the floor over to Catherine. So uh, public-based care, how can we distinguish it from the congregation-based social care? Do you agree with these concepts or not, is my question. Is that for me? Evet. Ya da yani Sema hocam siz de. Yes. So I'm not sure I understand what congress. Uh, what was the second term? Here's a translation issue. Con congress. Is it religiously based? Congregation based uh, social care. And what is con congressional? What does that mean? Efendim burada cemaat temelli bakım evet. lafını anlayabildiğimi söyleyemeyeceğim. Bunun ne anlama geldiğini 
it's very difficult for me to lead this conversation in that sense. And I think they are pointing out to the fact that we have to make a distinction between uh, social care and community care. And I think this is very close to Captain's approach. So we I'm have not... to make a distinction between these concepts is what the speaker is trying to say. So the congregation favors certain parts of the society, which they believe needs help. In a certain way, I think this could be a dissolving issue. We can keep care outside of the state's sphere and bring it back to the family and to the household. This is a very vast concept that we need to focus on. We need to consider the concept of care when we want to reconstruct the society from scratch. I would like to go back to the social services. As Catherine has stated, we have to think a series of concepts from scratch. And this is what we are obliged to do. And the fundamental problem here is, as we had discussed at the beginning of this meeting, where do social services stand in the building of future communities? And us involved in the social services, how are we supposed to interfere so that this sphere would provide more beneficial and more productive results? Can we create a new state, a new community? Can we become more free? Can we become more independent? So these are the discussions that we're trying to have. Can we live under more humanitarian conditions with further freedom, without alienating ourselves from the dynamics of the community? Humans, humans interfere with the crises and they develop new models, new structures. We are closely intertwined with the uh, social models and social structures that are extending ahead again to those in need. But in the light of the previous discussions, we should never forget that we are a profession. And this profession has certain ethics and certain methods. We need to revisit them. We need to create new models. We need to create new code of ethics for the way we conduct our businesses on a daily basis in order to prepare ourselves for the future. Anybody else willing to take the floor? I think Catherine wants to take the floor. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really important question. And I think one of the things that we discussed in the while writing the manifesto was precisely the how we understand the relationship between sort of uh, public care in terms of the state and community care. And clearly that relationship needs to be rethought and it needs to be rather than top down, which is what we often see with uh, public social services. What we would claim is that the that it needs to, that the best care is often community care, and how can we refigure, reconfigure the relationship between the state and communities, where the where that where the, where that uh, relationship is constantly being navigated and debated and reconfigured as as it goes. So I think that is a really really important question where we know. Uh, that care giving and care receiving is is most effective is when there is a community when it emerges from the community and when it's not imposed by the public sphere at the same time that the state needs to ensure that those communities have the resources and able to do that so how 
I think that's a con that's an ongoing question and one that cannot be resolved once and for all, but one that has to be constantly uh, negotiated on on on on the ground um, as we move forward and as we think about how we might put care front and center um, and how we can maintain some kind of participatory democracy in that process, which which often uh, is very difficult to do when you have uh, you know massive bureaucratic state institutions and and care and communities where um, where which have specific needs and a specific a specific makeup. So I think that that's an ongoing question and a really, really important one and one that has to be constantly negotiated as we move forward. Thank you. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Ee, çok teşekkür ederiz arkadaşlar. Ee, hepimiz çok yorgunuz. Ee, Sema hocam, e, siz. Yes, thank you. We are very tired. Ee, Sema, would you like to talk? This is what I need to say. We need to think. We can't answer these questions right now. We need to consider these issues as problems. We need to be more aware and. Um, whoever produces these phenomena will be historical figures. They will be, they will be, they will be registered within history as pioneers because we are transitioning from a community to congregation or congregation to community. We have to make distinctions between these definitions. And I would like to thank you. I have no further contributions to make. And hoping to meet you next year we are finalizing our meeting here right now and i am grateful for your contributions hopefully next year we are going to hold this meeting hold this conference with not only kent university participation but with the participation of many other universities from around europe and two or three months later, we will be launching the theme of the next meeting. The 10th conference will be organized in the light of the topic we shall identify. We will send you your participation uh, accreditation using your email addresses. So we are finalizing the meeting. Thank you.